must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings. Wide with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad. Left in a place, bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself. Seize the kite, my kite, you may. And things for a moment, an angel is there. Everybody, welcome to those at home. It is wonderful to see you joining us in such great numbers. Welcome to our online rally um, against complicity in the in the Gaza genocide. Defund genocide, not aid to the genocided. My name is Bianca Majeni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, one of the organizers of today's rally, alongside Just Peace Advocates. Uh, and CFPI is based in Montreal or Jojage on the territory of the Ganyangahaga people, but today I'm coming to you from Kampala, Uganda. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to our global online rally. Um, and we're here to oppose the role that our governments are playing in enabling Israel's genocide in Palestine. And we have a terrific lineup of speakers today uh, who have come together in response to our government's unconscionable decision to defund UNRWA, the UN Aid Agency for Palestinian Refugees, which happened immediately after the International Court of Justice ruled that Israel is plausibly committing genocide, including through deprivation of huma humanitarian aid to Gaza. It is quite simply an outrage. Uh, and as the title of our global rally states, we should be defunding genocide, not funding aid to the genocided. It is vital for us uh, to be gathering as we are today in great numbers to communicate our opposition to these responses and to express our unwavering solidarity with the people of Palestine. For our part here in Canada, our government has yet to even make a perfunctory statement indicating Israel is legally bound to abide by the ICJ ruling, nor has it stated explicitly that Canada will adhere to the world court rulings. It's hard to see uh, this as anything other than direct support for Israel's mass killing, 
to continue to sell arms, allowing registered charities to raise funds for the Israeli military, providing bilateral military support, among many, many other measures. Um, and we'll get to a lot more of that um, as, the, as the evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on where you are, unfolds. Um, before we get started, I just want to thank our endorsing organizations um, who will be mentioning um, throughout the event and in the chat. A special shout out um, to the tremendous help we received from the Free Rohingya Coalition, uh, Global Forces, as well as Global Forces uh, Renewal Southeast Asia uh, for SIA. We're also encouraging people to donate to UNRWA directly, and there'll be a, a link in the chat for you to be able to do that. So without further ado, um, I will now hand over to my wonderful uh, co-host, Aziza Kanji. Thank you, my sister, Bianca. I'm Aziza Kanji, a legal academic and journalist based in Toronto, colonized and occupied land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississauga people. We are so, so grateful to all our speakers, eminent scholars, artists, activists, who have all come here today on extremely short notice from across the colonial geography of our present um, in order to resist this absolutely unconscionable defunding of Munarwa. The fact that they've all made themselves available to us here today on such short notice is a testament to the absolute atrocity happening in Palestine over the last more than 100 days, as well as in the 100 years war on Palestine, in the words of eminent Palestinian historian Rashid Khalidi. We've been overwhelmed by the response to this event, um, and we also received so many supportive messages of solidarity from those who deeply regret that they cannot be here today. So for every speaker you hear here today, know that there are multitudes and multitudes behind them as well. This event in particular was inspired by similar events that have been organized to resist the Rohingya genocide by 4C and the Free Rohingya Coalition. We are so grateful for the collaboration of our Rohingya sisters and brothers, of our indigenous sisters and brothers who continue to show and light for us a path even in the face of genocidal erasure. Um, as we said, we've organized this on very short notice, so please forgive any shortcomings or technical glitches um, on our part, um, but we are all just so grateful and heartened to see the tremendous presence here today. Just last night, we learned of the U.S. court decision holding that Israel is plausibly committing genocide in Gaza, uh, reiterating the decision of the International Court of Justice. And yet that court still dismissed uh, the case on preliminary jurisdictional grounds, holding that it raised political questions. To start our rally, there is no one better we know of than um, to speak to this context of legalized impunity than eminent Palestinian legal scholar, former legal counsel to UNRWA, Dr. Ardi Imsais. Ardi. Well, thank you very much for having me today, uh, friends, uh, comrades. Um, I, I have to begin by asking everybody here to imagine being driven from your home simply because of who you are, your property, culture, memories, future, stolen from you simply because of who you are. Encamped in hovels under tents without sustenance, condemned to dwell that way, not for days, nor months, nor even years, but for decades, generation after generation, simply because of who you are. Imagine being held against your will in this emaciated condition, your every move monitored from birth to death, even your daily caloric intake and access to water, food, and other such, simply because of who you are. Imagine all of this, friends, and you, you just might be begin to understand what Palestinian life in the Gaza Strip before the 7th of October is. Before the Palestinians were cast as human animals and Amalek to be done away with, every man, woman, and child, before the International Court of Justice declared the situation a plausible genocide. UNRWA is the only humanitarian lifeline to the 2.3 million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. 
which is now experiencing levels of violence unprecedented in this century. Israeli action has resulted in over 26,000 dead, 64,000 injured, 1.7 million uh, forcibly transferred, starvation as a tool of war is being used, famine is about to set in. Now is not the time to stop funding UNRWA. Like all UN agencies, UNRWA has a zero tolerance policy for staff who engage in criminal activity. I know because I was part of the team in charge at the agency of administering this policy for years. But the decision of Western donors to suspend funding is irresponsible, cruel, and illegal. It's irresponsible because UNRWA is the only lifeline of humanitarian aid and assistance to the beleaguered population of the Gaza Strip during this genocide. It's cruel because it's collective punishment for the reasons that I've set out. UNRWA also offers support and assistance, humanitarian aid and assistance to 5.8 million Palestine refugees elsewhere in the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. And it is finally illegal because as signatories to the Genocide Convention, these Western states have a positive obligation to prevent genocide from happening in the Gaza Strip, including by urging Israel to ramp up humanitarian aid and assistance to the people in Gaza, not to stop it. So I'm here to support the call to stop defunding UNRWA. I'm here to support the Palestine refugees and the Palestinians all over the world and to call for the end of this genocide before it is too late. Thank you. Thank you, dear Artie, for those comments and for all your work. Now, Ronnie Castro's veteran of the ANC and the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. We are honored to have you with us. Please, Ronnie. Well, thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be part of this extraordinary event, an event of humanity, an event of international solidarity, and of course, outrage. Outrage with the crimes, the genocidal crimes of Israel, and outrage at the way in which big brother leader decides on the withdrawal of funding and all the accomplices from Canada to the UK to Italy and Germany and all the usual colonial suspects, the former colonial powers together with big brother who takes a decision and the usual crowd step in, step behind, bar, bar, black sheep. That's the crowd. It's absolutely outrageous. But at the same time, yet again, they expose themselves to global populists, to the world, to humanity. And this will go down against them, against those governments and countries for time immemorial as we stand by the Palestinians when they need us, they need our solidarity, and they need the UNRWA, which going back to the commencements of the Nakba, back in 48, 49, it was established by the UN. So we can ask ourselves two things. One is, why take this action? And the second is their rationale. I'll briefly deal with that. In terms of why they act, they're acting in support of Israel, which they protect because Israel ensures the control and domination to a degree challenged more and more of the Middle East, from the Mediterranean through to Asia, from the Suez through to India and beyond. That was the reason from the word go. The protection of our interests, says Biden, genocide Joe, when he says that if Israel didn't exist, we would have invented it because it helps to protect our interests. And this is why they see UNRWA 
as the absolute thread binding the Palestinian people from the time of that Nakba right through to today in Gaza, in the West Bank, the occupied territories, wherever they're refugees, in the refugee camps, in the neighboring states, and indeed the Palestinians of the diaspora. Because the lifeblood that UNRWA provides keeps the Palestinians connected. It maintains their national identity in so many different ways by keeping them alive in so many different ways through food, sustenance, employment, schooling. It's vital. And they are on, led by the USA, behind Israel. They on an absolute, and I'll use the word crusade, to smash the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. And this is why they have to do away with UNRWA to bleed it to death, to make it lose its capacity. And with it, they hope to see the Palestinians shattered further together with the bombs that, the, that they provide Israel and that Israel visits on them. Let me just briefly come to their rationale. The first speaker's made reference. Um, UNRWA, 10 to 12 people out of 13,000 in Gaza, Israel alleges, has been involved in, in the events of 7th of, of October. Where's the proof? Where's the evidence? Israel cannot be trusted. And Israel says that they were involved on the basis of 12 people out of 13,000 in Gaza and 30,000 throughout the region, and that gets defunded. Shame on you, Canadian government. Shame on the USA and the UK and the others. It's absolutely diabolical, and it plays into the genocidal agenda of the Israeli Zionist project, the colonial settlement apartheid project. And on this basis, we see through the lies we stand by UNRWA. We demand that UNRWA receives its funding. We raise our voices as we raise our voices in solidarity with the Palestinian people. And from South Africa and elsewhere throughout the world, I believe we talk for everybody. We stand by UNRWA and we stand by the Gaza people, the Palestinian people, wherever they are. I am proud to be part of this major initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie Casperls. And yes, please donate to UNRWA. We are putting the links in the chat for you to do so. Please donate and show that these policies of these colonial governments do not represent us who live um, on these lands. Now we will be hearing from Neve Gordon, Professor of Human Rights Law at Queen uh, Mary University of London, and one of the most incisive critics of uh, Israel's use of law to maintain its dispossession and domination of Palestinians. The wonderful Neve. Thank you, Aziza, and thank you all the organizers for putting this event together in such short notice. I'm sure you've been working 20 hour a day in the past few days. I'll begin. Australia, Austria. Canada, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Iceland, Italy, Japan, Latvia, Lithuania, Netherlands, New Zealand, Romania, Sweden, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and the United States announced that they are indefinitely pausing payments to UNRWA in response to Israel's allegation that a dozen agency staff members were involved in the October 7th attacks. These countries' leaders appear to be interested in taking part in a very dangerous experiment, this time with education, medical care, and famine. The willingness to defund UNRWA, which for the past 75 years has been providing life-saving assistance, not only to 70% of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, but also to millions of Palestinian refugees in the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan is mind-boggling. 
the willingness to defund UNRWA just a few days after the highest court in the land ruled that it is plausible that Israel is violating the Genocide Convention and destroying in whole or in part the 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza is indeed beyond belief. This decision, based on the accusation that 12 out of Gaza's 13,000 UNRWA employees participated in the October 7th attack on Israel, will, if followed through, have an unimaginably devastating impact on the lives of millions of Palestinians throughout the region for years, if not decades, to come. This experiment seems to have two distinct, if related, goals. First, world leaders have decided to experiment in anti-humanitarian intervention. They appear to be interested in examining alongside Israel whether famine, lack of health care, lack of education, alongside wholesale destruction and massive loss of life can be used as an instrument to quash the Palestinian struggle for freedom. The strategy is straightforward. Israel has reduced the Palestinians in Gaza to bare life, and now Western leaders are adopting a defunding strategy aimed at literally forcing them to bow down to Israeli demands. The experiment's second goal is to erase Palestinian refugee who UNRWA was set up to assist about 750,000 Palestinian refugees after the creation of Israel in 1948, the Palestinian Nakba. Whether these Palestinians fled or were forcibly expelled from their towns and villages may be a point of contention, but there is no argument that after the war had subsided, Israel refused to allow Palestinians to return to their homes, thus violating Article 11 of United Nations Resolution 194. Israel's refusal to abide by UN resolutions and different international convention is how the Palestinian refugee problem was created. Today, the descendants of these refugees make up about 6 million people 1.6 million of whom live in Gaza. The world always assumed that the plight and political and legal status of these refugees would be resolved through the creation of a Palestinian state. And yet from Israel's perspective, the Palestinian refugees are a threat. They are a threat because according to international law, they have a right to return to their homeland, a right that Israel has breached for 75 years. Therefore, leaders like Netanyahu for many years have claimed that the refugees are, and I quote, a fiction. The attacks on UNRWA are not new, and the logic here is clear. If the funding to the agency responsible for registering millions of refugees and for ensuring their basic needs is stopped, then they may, may cease to be considered refugees. The idea is to destroy UNRWA so that the refugees will no longer be refugees. If this deranged post-truth reality, in this deranged post-truth reality, there are no Palestinian refugees. And because there are no refugees, there is no reason for Palestinians to have a state from Cambodia to China and all the way to Europe. The 20th century saw its share of experiments on humans, all of which had had horrific consequences. Tragically, those who are threatening to defund UNRWA are trying hard to present this experiment as a struggle against terrorism, while it is actually a declaration of war against the Palestinian people and active participation in current genocide against them. Thank you. Thank you, Neve, for those powerful and profoundly disturbing words. Now we're going to hear from Shireen Sheikh Ali, eminent professor of history, University of California, Santa Barbara. 
Thank you so much, Shireen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen Saikali. I'm so glad to be here with you all. A man in his 50s walks wrapped in a tattered blanket. He is haggard, his face swallowed by hunger, his eyes blackened with despair. He is one of the many on the march from Khan Yunus to the last spot in Gaza, Rafah. Another man recognizes him. Uncle, you are still alive. Tell us how you are. The man opens his ravished, parched mouth to speak, and all he can muster are tears. This man and his suffering are a product of unbridled Israeli brutality, funded and aided by the United States, a brutality that the ICJ has called plausible genocide. And today, instead of heeding this call, 12 countries have decided to defund the only remaining lifeline of the Palestinians in the ravished Gaza Strip, UNRWA. Today is the 118th day of a fall that has lasted a lifetime. Israel has killed over 27,000 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and over 387 Palestinians in the West Bank. Today, every single Palestinian in the Gaza Strip is displaced. Every single person in the Gaza Strip is hungry. One in four are on the verge of famine. We witness how Palestinians in Gaza live that hunger. We know what starvation does to the body, feeding on stores of fat, moving to the muscles, eroding the heart, shutting down the immune system, rendering concentration impossible, and ending in a slow and painful death. We watch as Israel hones starvation as a weapon of war. And today we watch as selfish, cynical countries take active part in that genocide and in that honing of starvation as a weapon of war. Today, Palestine is the place where a world is unmade, a world where the illusions of international law, humanitarianism, the claims of civilization shatter ever further into an inferno of hypocrisies and lies. Today, a child dies every 10 minutes. And as we witness this ongoing, escalating, reiterative Nakba, this genocide, let us listen to the abundant lessons Palestine teaches us. We cannot await a secular salvation or a messianic apocalypse in Palestine or on earth. We are in the apocalypse. Palestine reminds us that there is no post-colonial, post-racial, or post-Zionist. And as we struggle with this condition, of a permanent temporary suspended in time, we learn from these Palestinians who make life amidst the certainty of their death. Most important than anything else is to keep our eyes on these Palestinians themselves, to insist time and again on our peoplehood, to learn how they shape life under the force of death. We watch them as they make as they make makeshift tent camps, and they attempt to bring joy to one another. We watch as a new generation, like the nine-year-old Lama Jammus, report, record, and voice the realities of Palestinian life under the force of genocide. Palestinians are not the embodiment of a future threat. The rhetoric that the young who are now disabled, orphaned, and bereft will grow to become vengeful is a denial of everything Palestinians have taught us. Palestinians teach us to live despite the trauma, despite a foreclosed future. And for no matter what Israelis and its handmaid and their handmaidens do, Palestinians will exist. We will write, we will make music, we will archive, and we will labor tirelessly, tirelessly and once again for our freedom. Thank you, Shireen and the Palestinians for continuing to teach us how to live and how to love. Now, we are so honored to have a special message from Angela Davis, who needs no introduction, legendary black feminist abolitionist scholar activist. Angela Davis, the video, please. My name is Angela Davis. And I'm grateful to have been offered the opportunity to participate along with many others in this collective display of solidarity with the Palestinian people in Gaza, who have experienced more suffering 
that any human beings deserve. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, over 20,000 people have been killed since October 7, including one out of every 120 children in Gaza. Every day, Palestinian life is being extinguished and Palestinian homes, schools, mosques, and churches are being destroyed. Palestinian society in Gaza is the designated target of bombs more destructive than most of us have ever witnessed. This is why we are urging people who call for peace to do whatever is possible to prevent the impending genocide. The United Nations Relief and Work Agency, the most important source of aid for Palestinians in Gaza is now the target of those who wish to guarantee the continuation of the genocidal assault on Gaza. Again, we are witnessing a grotesque disproportionality in the way Israel and the United States have aimed their sights at UNRWA. There are claims that approximately 12 UNRWA employees were involved in the Hamas attack. Without discounting the reality of grief and suffering, regardless of the quantity involved. It should be recognized that 13,000 people are employees of UNRWA in Gaza, and 30,000 if we count the total number of people who work for the agency. The call to halt donations to UNRWA is tantamount to a call to accelerate the move toward genocide in Gaza. The discrediting of UNRWA may have been linked to a strategy designed to draw attention away from the ICJ ruling last Friday that called for close monitoring of Israel's actions in the war in Gaza, having found it plausible that Israel's acts could amount to genocide. A group of almost 20 special rapporteurs, including on human rights in Palestine and on internally displaced people, on women and girls, and on a broad range of subjects, issued a statement yesterday on January 31st, indicating that they interpret the court's findings as dismissing Israel's justification of its actions as self-defense in compliance with international humanitarian law. They went on to say that the court found that Israel cannot continue to bombard, displace, and starve the population of Gaza while allowing its officials to dehumanize Palestinians through statements that may amount to genocidal incitement, end quote. This is what the world needs to hear. And the attack on UNRWA is a distraction. This is a time to stand with South Africa. And this is a time to thank the special rapporteurs for speaking the truth as we welcome the rising numbers of people around the world who have vowed to stand with Palestine to call for an immediate ceasefire and for a path towards justice for Palestine, for the region, and for the world. Thank you for that powerful message from Dr. Davis. Now I'm going to turn it back to my co-host, uh, Bianca, who will be moderating and introducing our next series of speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aziza. And um, thanks, many, many thanks to Angela for that powerful message. Um, what an extraordinary show of solidarity uh, we're seeing here today. 
Um, and also such beautiful messages from um, the people at home in our live audience calling for a free Palestine. It's incredible to be here um, with a live audience of more than 500 people on such short notice. It's very, very encouraging. Our next speaker is Mazen Kumsia, who is a Palestinian scientist and author uh, who's joining us live from Bethlehem. Welcome, Mazen. Oh, I, th I think we're going to move on to the next person. I'm not seeing Mazen in the room. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, our next speaker, Chris Guinness. Um, who is also joining us uh, live. Um, he's a former UNRWA spokesperson, um, currently with the Myanmar Accountability Project. Welcome, Chris. It's a real honor, and I would like to thank the organizers for having me here. And to mention, incidentally, that today is the third anniversary of the coup in Myanmar, which brought a genocidal junta back to power. Um, and it's a great tribute to the other regarding um, spirit of the Burmese people that on such a tragic milestone for them, what are they doing? They're organizing and being part of organizing uh, an extraordinary rally. And as I say, it's an honor to be here um, for you know another Muslim population on the planet. Um, the Rohingyas being <clears throat> the others that were, um, that were massacred um, in 2017. So thank you and allow me to make that reminder. Um, I'm, 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 um, humbled by the contributions of, of everyone so far. And um, I've thrown away my notes, my speaking points, because I'd like um, not to duplicate what's been said before. Um, I did public advocacy in UNRWA from 2007 to the beginning of 2020. And um, what I'd like to do is suggest some practical advocacy actions um, for this meeting. Um, which I think is perhaps, I say with humility, the most useful thing I might be able to do. So just to roll back a bit, um, the UNRWA Commissioner General was called into a meeting in Tel Aviv, and he was told, he was handed over information, which hardly, um, I wouldn't even like to use the word evidence for, and it was essentially a list of names. And I spoke to UNRWA colleagues this morning, and they have never been handed the dossier which was given to the New York Times, as we've said, as a piece of cynical news manipulation within 24 hours after um, the ruling on provisional measures by the International Court of Justice. And um, UNRWA has not been given that dossier, neither by the Israelis, nor by the major donors who are now defunding them. And this raises in my mind um, the whole question of what can be done to, um, to reverse this um, decision. Um, which is what I shall come to at the end of my of my thoughts. Um, there are two things I think to say about this donor response. First of all, UNRWA has never been told why it happened. I mean, one could perhaps be forgiven for thinking it's not a political plot if the organization, if, if the agency had been told, and we're doing this because we'd like to achieve this objective. That conversation, those that, that's never been said to UNRWA. UNRWA has never been told what the strategy is why have it's actually 16 um, and counting of the major donors just taken half a billion dollars or suspended half a million dollars? Neither has UNRWA been told um, what it has to do to reverse this decision. You would have thought that good donorship would be about saying, well, we've got a problem. It's been brought to our attention. You need to do the following things. That conversation has never, been happen has never happened either. What UNRWA did was to dismiss without any due process the now 13 staff members, um, three at least, are either dead um, or missing um, without any due process, even before the investigation by the Office of Internal, uh, the OIOS, the Office of Internal Oversight in New York, had even begun its inquiry, its investigation. <clears throat> um, and so um, I would like to turn the idea of accountability on its head and say, yes, of course, UNRWA, an agency which is proud of its record on neutrality, its education, its textbooks, all of that, um, this, if it turns out to be true, from UNRWA's perspective, is a few um, rotten apples in, um, you know, as other people have said, um, over about 33,000 staff region-wide and 13,000 um, in Gaza. Um, so the question then is, what can, um, what can, can we do in terms of holding our, um, our own governments accountable. Now, what's very clear 
is that, and if you look at what Anthony Blinken, for example, has said, he said, um, we've not been able to confirm independently these allegations, but we think they're very, very credible. Now, let's just think about that. Um, the US Secretary of State that has led the donor community in taking a half a billion dollars away from an agency that is mitigating the humanitarian impact of a genocide, a, a, a plausible genocide, to quote the words of the ICJ, in which America, as we saw in the federal court in, um, in California, is um, considered to be perhaps complicit, um, um, is, is withholding funds from. So um, I think, you know, we have to, first of all, ask um, Anthony Blinken and the American government, and I think journalists involved with this group need to ask at the State Department and elsewhere, whenever they can, on what basis, what did you know when you made this decision to defund UNRWA? Because UNRWA has never, and you can quote me, sources inside UNRWA, UNRWA has never been given the dossier that was given to the New York Times. Andrew Mitchell, the US, uh, sorry, the, the our, our, um, development secretary, um, I don't believe for a moment that it would be interesting to ask him, and we must all ask our own development ministers or the equivalent of, what did you know? What was the basis upon which you suspended aid? Because it seems very clear from the evidence we've had, and there's a Sky News report today, you can see it's on the website. Um, Sky News is saying, we've been given the dossier too. I think Sky News is probably less pro-Israel than the New York Times, but Sky News is saying um, a lot of it doesn't really stack up and an awful lot of it doesn't relate to UNRWA. Well, we need to hold our own governments to account. We need to ask them, what did you know? Have you shared the information with UNRWA? Because, you know, the neutrality framework, as Ardi has worked on, will testify. Um, they've kicked in, they've worked. Um, for decades. And what happens is if the donors have credible evidence, then they hand it over to UNRWA, they ask for an investigation. UNRWA will always investigate credible reports and it will take disciplinary action always up to and including dismissal from the agency, which by the way, in Gaza at the moment means you and your family are plunged below the poverty line. Um, so um, allow me, I guess, to end by saying it's an advocacy point what we need to do is hold our governments to account and embarrass them. We need to say, we want the information. You're saying UNRWA should be accountable. UNRWA is accountable. We've worked with these donors through the decades. They are as much responsible for UNRWA's neutrality frameworks and implementing as, we, as, as UNRWA is. So let's ask our governments, what did you know? What was the basis? Let's see these dossiers. What was the evidence? Because in the absence of real evidence, one can only draw the conclusion that they are deliberately politicizing aid for the reasons that other speakers on this panel have outlined, that they want, they think that by getting rid of UNRWA, they're getting rid of six million refugees. That's a bit like saying that if you get rid of Oxfam, you've got rid of poor people. Um, these are human beings. They have the right to dignity and prosperity. They have the right to justice and accountability. And just because the agency that serves them disappeared, that does not mean that these people also go. They have inalienable rights. So, you know, let's keep our eye on the big picture. But in the meantime, please let us all get all the journalists we know anytime any of us are meeting with anyone in officialdom we need to ask those questions on what basis did you defund UNRWA and I think that is a really good tactic that's one of the many suggestions I hope will come out of this meeting so thank you all very very much indeed compelling thank you Chris for your powerful analysis and um and, and for your call to action um and accountability I now have the great honor of introducing historian, journalist, and political commentator, Vijay Prashad. Welcome, Vijay. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bianca. Really honored to be here. It's great to follow Chris. Chris may not remember this, but um, in Gaza, at the aftermath of Operation Protective Edge in 2014, I was really harassing Chris uh, to get information to get a comment and so on, Chris, you will well remember, we thought that that 2014 bombing, Chris, was the end of the world. This, my friends, is in a different league. This is not 
2014. This is the destruction of a part of the earth. Forget just the attempt to annihilate the Palestinians. It's grotesque. I thought I wouldn't see anything as ugly as the 2014 assault. 2,000 people killed in a matter of some weeks. Um, this is infinitely worse than that. I want to ask people to go to the website of the institute I direct, thetricontinental.org. Today, we released a newsletter um, which premiered a painting by the very great Palestinian painter from Gaza, Malak Matar. Um, it's a five meter long painting, the Guernica of Gaza. She calls it Gaza 2024. I really want to encourage you to go and have a look at Malak Matar's painting. It is extraordinary. It shows you that despite everything, despite everything that the Israelis have tried to throw against the Palestinian people for decades, despite everything, the Palestinians continue to dream, continue to fight, and so on, despite everything. I also want to say. Bianca, and I want to underline this pretty firmly, that Israel is losing this. Israel is not winning anything. In fact, Israel has had to move to the so-called phase three of the war, which means they pulled their ground troops out of most of Gaza after the 21 were killed um, just about 10 days ago. They are losing the war, not just... Um, the public relations war, but they're losing on the ground. They're not able to fulfill their complete objectives. Now they have displaced 2 million human beings. Almost the entirety of the Palestinian population in Gaza has been displaced. But having displaced these 2 million Palestinians, the Israelis are finding themselves in the same position as the United States found itself in Afghanistan with other Western powers. as the United States found itself in Iraq. You can bomb, you can destroy, but you cannot break the spirit of people. The Taliban returned, the Afghans rejected the United States, despite immense firepower wielded against them for 20 years. What the United States experienced in Afghanistan is what the Israelis are experiencing in Gaza. There is, in fact, a military challenge to them, which I don't think we should underestimate. Related to that, the Israelis have lost the public relations battle around the world. South Africa's case they took to the International Court of Justice is extremely significant, backed as it was by countries of the global south. Let the global north gather together. Let them do what they want. But they've lost not only their ability to influence the world. They've lost the entire global south. From Indonesia to Namibia to Bolivia, people are standing with Palestine. They are fed up with the bullying that comes from Washington, D.C., London, Paris, et cetera. Fed up. And the ICJ case is as much the global south taking the global north to the ICJ as it is South Africa disputing Israel. at the ICJ. On this point, the cut to UNRWA, the cruel, sadistic cut to UNRWA by Western countries, including the mediocre Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Justin Trudeau, that cut to UNRWA, that sadistic cut, is a sign of desperation by the global North, not a sign of their power or their influence. It is a sign of their weakness, and we must see it like that. It is therefore incumbent upon us not to beg these countries to continue funding UNRWA. It is time we put pressure on Turkey, on Indonesia, on China, on other countries of the South to start picking up the bill at UNRWA. We need to pivot away, no longer beggars at the door of the North, but asking the South to stand up with a backbone and fund The Palestinians, if 2 million people come onto the streets of Jakarta in defense of the Palestinians, where is the Indonesian government? Why are they not coming forward and paying the bill? 
They have higher growth rate than the United States. Come and assist the Palestinians materially through UNRWA. We are not beggars anymore. We don't want to stand in front of mediocre, desperate politicians like Biden, Sunak, Macron, Olaf Schultz, and the pathetic Justin Trudeau. They have no legitimacy in our eyes. They are spent. Their time is gone. We stand with the Palestinians, but we also stand with all the formerly colonized people who are saying we have a new mood. We no longer want to take your nonsense. The world is ours as much as it's yours. Free Palestine. Pal Palestine will be free. Thanks a lot. Rousing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vijay. Free Palestine. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your words and for your work, inspiring as always you hear. Next, we're going to be hearing from publisher and activist Judith Gerwich. Welcome, Judith. Oh, Judith, you're muted. Thank you. So you hear me now? Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored to be surrounded by such prestigious people. Uh, I don't have any of your credential. So I would like to make my talk very brief. Uh, and I have three points to make. One as a publisher, um, one as an analyst, because I'm also a psychoanalyst, a Lacanian psychoanalyst, and also as a Jew. So I heard, and those are rumors, but who knows, because I have a feeling that these rumors may, may be true, that a number of employees of UNRWA who have been fired have confessed on the torture uh, about these uh, participating in, in October 7. So it turns out, I don't know if it's true, but it's a few places that I found this, this information. So you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, um, but I wouldn't be surprised because um, a very important book that I'm publishing this spring, which is by uh, Nasser Abu Sur, that is called The Tale of a Wall, recounts um, in great detail how being um, confessing on the torture, which is the reason why he's in prison now for 31 years, um, has an effect where uh, you don't know anymore what happened before the torture. Your memory is affected and you can't recall exactly what happened and what you did. So the confessing on torture, which is something Israeli seems to have done now for many, many years, is involved in um, this uh, very strange situation uh, where now it looks like uh, that's the excuse that those, those confessions are the excuse um, to defund the sole provider of an humanitarian aid for Palestinian refugee across the region. So that's something quite shocking in my view that that's the foundation uh, of the, the defunding on UNRWA. Now, the second point uh, that I would like to make and this is a point I would like to make as an analyst, so you'll excuse the jargon, um, that the UNRWA's longstanding work with refugees, to me, stand as a vivid reminder of the consequences of the first Nakba. As if having um, a humanitarian aid, helping refugees to, to sustain their dignity and their lives is basically, um, um, is in a way reminding Israel of uh, of the Nakba that they had committed. So in a way, you could say that UNRWA stands for the superego, super the conscience of Israel. So in a way, this is why I think, and that's what's so horrible, is that that's the reason why UNRWA, uh, Israel want, wants to get rid of UNRWA, because it is they don't want to have their conscience um, you know, bothering them where they commit what they do. And uh, this conscience is very much alive in many Israeli I know who are appalled by what's happening, and I don't want them to be forgotten. Um, there are many that you know too, like Gideon Levy and many others who are fighting very much along our lines. So my accusation of Israel doesn't address them. So we have to make that, I want to make that very clear. So basically, it's Netanyahu and his government who want to um, get rid of their superego so they can be free uh, to be to be psychopaths. And I mean, this is exactly what seems to happen now. Uh, so they can be free to be psychopaths and, and act accordingly, especially when the second Nakba seems to be in the work. 
So uh, the problem with this, of course, that we Americans uh, and we Jews who are not uh, living in Israel, or some of them maybe are, are, are in agreement with me, um, we are accomplice of this psychopathic plan. So as a Jew, I feel deeply that my heritage now has not only been rape, raped, but also exploited. And this is why I believe that Jews everywhere in the diaspora must, must stand up and lead the resistance we are doing here today. Lack of conscience makes democracy impossible. And the defunding on UNRWA is a symptom that our center, especially in the West, no longer holds. So this is why I think, you know, it's important not only for, for the Palestinian, for the survival of Israel, if it's still possible, and also for our own survival, that we join and join this resistance, but that we also find, you know, intelligent argument uh, to somehow get all this Western government to wake up. So thank you so much. I'm so honored to be with you and um, hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. Important words, um, important work. Terrific to hear from you. Such clarity. Um, we are now going to be hearing live from Palestinian artist, poet, poet and filmmaker, Lina Abojarade. Welcome, Lina. Lena, I think you're, you just have to unmute. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for holding events like these um, to bring, you know, activists and, and people who really, you know, believe in a free Palestine together um, as a Palestinian, um, as a, you know, as a refugee who's kind of, uh, you know, denied her, her, her land. It gives me a lot of hope to see so many people working for the stream. Um, so, because a picture speaks a thousand words, I thought I would share some of my poetry and some of my artwork to kind of speak uh, on behalf of what I believe in terms of Palestine, just kind of to to give something different. I'm sure so many people provided political analysis and, and different uh, viewpoints, but this is kind of just a chance to, you know, connect with our feelings for Palestine and for me to kind of express uh, what I have to say about it. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing two poems today. And uh, like the event was kind of short notice. So I've kind of mixed and matched different poems with kind of slideshows of my works or different videos that I've done. So I hope you enjoy. Um, can you give me the authority to share my screen? Sorry. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do that. Hold on. Let me ask the host. Uh, Karen, are you able? I think okay. it's working Apple. now. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's working. Thank you. Okay, can can you see the screen okay? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay. 117 days and 75 years of dusting bones that are never laid to rest, of wounds never healing, reopening in the chests of newborn children, of summers dressed in out-of-date massacres and frostbite winters that collude with death. 117 days and 75 years. Still, there she stands, singing a distant song, my homeland, my homeland. And the morning sun bring news to a holy land of a newborn's war cry and a martyr's last goodbye. And the guns 
will inspire a child to write a letter in his father's blood to those who kill but have not yet won, to the occupier. You can adorn our bodies with bullet holes, imprison our young, displace our old, break the bones of our concrete homes, collect our mother's tears, put our children to sleep to the lullaby of drones. Still, the children will play in fields of red poppies and the mothers will pray. The youth will dream and the old will recall. Our souls will sing even as our bodies fall. My homeland, my homeland. Palestine will remain a womb and a grave for those free men to take their first steps towards liberty and their last breath in victory. The red poppies will always bloom and our souls will continue to sing, my homeland, my homeland. Thank you. Okay, um, so I'd also like to share um, another poem um, along with some of my artwork um, that kind of depicts Palestinian suffering, but also hope. Um, and the, the previous poem was actually um, inspired by this artwork. Um, so this is the artwork that kind of went with that poem. And the reason I share it with you today is because um, this this artwork really reminds me of the strength and resilience of Palestinians that no matter how many uh, bodies that they kill, um, you can't kill an idea. Ghassan Kenafani um, once said that bodies will fall, but ideas will never uh, die. And so this kind of just depicts this idea that resistance will continue to be born so long as there's suffering and that one day this will lead to a liberated Palestine. Um, okay. I'm not sure if it's loading, but so far we're not able to see anything on the screen, Lena. Oh, okay. So you can't see anything on the screen? No, it's it's blank. Like I can see that something is trying to play, but it's it's not. Oh, playing. okay. And is there audio? Like, is the poem playing? No, not for me. Okay. Um. Okay, one second, let me try to figure it out. Okay, so can you see it now? Yeah, yes, yeah, I can see an image now. It's like a, it's like a slideshow. Um, can you hear the poem that I'm playing? No, there's no audio. Um, do you know how we can do that on Zoom, like to have it play the audio of the computer? N no, no, I'm, I, I personally won't be able to do that. Maybe there's someone in the back who might be able to do that, or maybe we could come back to your video later on. Yes, while we work it out, uh, we'll come, yeah. can we okay. come back to you later. We'll just move to the sure. back. Yeah, thank sorry you. about the technical difficulties. It's okay, thank you so much, Lena. I think we all knew we weren't going to get too far into this event today without tears. Um, and just thank you for bringing your powerful art, and we'll look forward to returning to it um, later in the event once we've sorted out any technical difficulties. Now... We are going to hear a message of solidarity from the brilliant Indigenous Mishi Sagig Nishnabeg, writer, artist, and scholar of decolonial love, Leanne Simpson.
Nisalin, if we can play Leanne Simpson's video, please. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Our wonderful Rohingya brother, Nason Lin, is holding it down in the back with all this very complicated tech. Perhaps while we're teeing that up, we are going to go to um, Jonathan Kutab, legendary, formidable Palestinian international human rights lawyer and a founder of Al Haq, Jonathan Kutab, and then we will um, hear from um, Leanne Simpson. Jonathan. Uh I think we have Leanne on the screen now. Right, yes, we have Leanne here. So we'll have Leanne first and then Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Nisan Lin. Oh, but the sound still isn't working. So while we work out the sound issues, Jonathan will return to you and your powerful voice. And inshallah, the sound will be coming through powerfully on the video as well, eventually. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Aziza, and thanks for those who put together on such short notice such an impressive uh, long list of experts and uh, activists in this field. Uh, I want to thank them all. Uh, I don't want to repeat what everybody else has been uh, saying, uh, but I just want to make uh, one point. Uh, my wife has been uh, a director of uh, UNRWA for social services for many years. So I'm very familiar with uh, UNRWA, uh, which has always had to deal with an ambivalent Israeli attitude. Uh, while they publicly attack UNRWA, they really wanted to continue uh, to do its work because it was relieving them of uh, so many uh, responsibilities. So UNRWA has always had to play that balancing act of strictly maintaining its neutrality, uh, providing humanitarian services uh, while facing uh, a public uh, attacks and enmity by those who think that by somehow eliminating UNRWA, you eliminate the problem of Palestinian refugees and their desire uh, for return, which is what all uh, Palestinian refugees uh, dream about. What is relevant about this current uh, crisis uh, is how, uh, number one, on very spurious uh, evidence uh, or almost no evidence uh, that 12 members of UNRWA somehow are were involved in the October 7 uh, activities, uh, and with very little proof, even if that was all true, and these 12 people uh, have to be dismissed from UNRWA, that doesn't explain why in such a short time, 17 countries would suspend the funding of UNRWA. How do we explain that? The only explanation I can think of is what uh, one previous speaker referred to as the difference between the North and the South. Uh, the North wants to use international law and international institutions when it is in their interest to use uh, those institutions uh, for its own particular purposes. And the South, which really believes in international law and really believes in universal principles and really believes in international institutions, including the ICJ uh, and the International Criminal Court. So this is, I think, the real lesson of the current crisis. What is really on trial here and what was really on trial before the ICJ are the international institutions themselves. Can they and will they serve humanity on an objective, neutral basis? Or will they allow themselves to be just tools for the powerful and the rich to use against third world countries whenever they choose? And if they don't serve their interests, then they will dismiss them and sideline them and consider them irrelevant. 
it is for this reason that I think this event and this rise of collectively of civil society throughout the world in defense of international law, in defense of international institutions, and in defense of the humanity of humankind. For this reason, I am very pleased to see this collective demonstration by civil society worldwide supporting UNRWA, supporting its humanitarian task. Because there is no other explanation. UNRWA has been doing wonderful work under very difficult circumstances. Even as we sit here today, there's about 154 sites for UNRWA that is hosting more than a million refugees who have been internally displaced, who don't have a roof over their head, who don't have some very basic uh, needs, humanitarian needs, totally apart from the political significance and the importance of the Palestinian people and their resistance to an ongoing genocide. So thank you, Anarwa, and we will support Anarwa every way we can. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And yes, please, everyone, support Anra every way you can. We're going to post the link again for Anra donations. Everyone who is able to donate, please continue continue donating. Um, we're still working on getting the sound back. We know Zoom has a track record of silencing of Palestinians, and this is yet another example of that. Um, we have many beautiful messages to share, including, um, as we said before, from our uh, indigenous ally and collaborator, Leanne Betasamasake Simpson, uh, from Hafsa Kanjwal, who's a Kashmiri scholar uh, facing uh, related forms of settler colonial violence in Kashmir. But while we're waiting to get those videos working for you again, we are now going to turn to David Palumbo Lu, decolonial abolitionist scholar activist at Stanford University and stalwart uh, activist in defense of Palestinian just, justice for Palestinians. David, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, it should not be surprising that the states that have decided to suspend support for UNRWA would, with such alacrity, leap to embrace the absurd narrative Israel is spun to delegitimize the agency. This is because this narrative, or ones like it, have existed since 1948. UNRWA has always been a thorn in the side of Israel, and this is part of a long process. It was founded by the United Nations precisely to be a conduit of international material support for Palestinians turned into refugees by the Nakba, and perhaps as a small token of the world's conscience. UNRWA has persistently been targeted, attacked, and scrutinized and attempts to delegitimize it frequent and virulent, not unlike the historical persecution of the Palestinian people themselves. The defunding of UNRWA by these states must be regarded as a continuation of this heinous process. But it's also a sharp rebuke of South Africa and all those states and peoples who have supported the South African case against uh, Israel and the ICJ. Israel has always been a non-participant in international humanitarian law. This is no surprise. It was surprised when it was called to account, as Chris pointed out. They know they're losing, as Vijay pointed out. It's an act of desperation, this defunding move. Israel is asking us, how dare we step out of place and call things by their proper names and make use of the remedies that international humanitarian law supposedly affords all peoples. How dare the ICJ not swallow the ridiculous defense Israel mounted against South Africa's airtight application? The obsessive attention given to Hamas's attacks on October 7th is part of a persistent deflection of attention from the real crimes which, as South Africa reminded the world, Israel has carried out since its inception. These crimes of ethnic cleansing, 
persistent environmental and economic damage, attacks on health, education, and welfare, brutal military and settler assaults show even more the absolute necessity of UNRWA. UNRWA's work is precisely to try to mitigate Israel's programmatic assaults on Palestinian life, programmatic assaults we now name as genocide. South Africa, to whom we owe a huge debt, pointed out over and over and over again that genocide is a process, not a singular event. It's a process prepared for, embodied always, in the dehumanization of a population. Thus, we must see the ICJ decision as an historical moment in which the world is challenged to manifest its humanity. This humanity must be manifest as dissent from the mendacities Israel is regurgitating in predictable fashion. This humanity is in fact manifested today in the millions globally who have taken to the streets and who refuse to accept the narrative of the emergence of death and who are making sure business cannot go on as usual. We, take, we must take it upon ourselves to force those in power, especially those signatories of the Genocide Convention, to do their moral and ethical duty. No more arms sales to Israel. No more diplomatic cover for a genocidal state. Increased support for UNRWA and all agencies and organizations that are the lifelines for the Palestinian people and repudiations of Israel's genocidal policies. By boycott? divest from and sanction Israel, end the occupation, allow Palestinians to return to their land and dismantle apartheid. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now um, we have Dr. Mazen Komsia who has uh, arrived here with us a Palestinian scientist and author joining us live from occupied Bethlehem. Mazen, thank you, and we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, and I'm sorry for being late. I had an urgent matter to take care of that developed uh, unexpectedly in a humanitarian situation. Uh, but anyway, I will. Uh, I didn't listen, obviously, to the other speakers, but I know many of them, and I uh, roughly know what they would have covered in some sense. So I want to focus on another issue besides the ICJ and uh, Gaza situation that's immediate. And that is, uh, I want to widen the picture a little bit and look at what's happening regionally and globally. Uh, as you know, humanity faces huge challenges, not just wars and conflict. Uh, which could end humanity because this could develop into a regional war, uh, is already developing into a regional conflict and then a global conflict. And global conflict uh, by necessity means nuclear weapons now uh, because uh, there had never been in human history where people developed so many uh, uh, tools of destruction and, and have not used them. So there's always a very, very strong possibility, I would say, if there's a, a global war, uh, it will be a nuclear war in which uh, China, Russia, Iran, Israel, the US, uh, NATO will enter into. Uh, but that's one, one threat that we face. You know about climate change already. Uh, that's a second threat. There is a habitat destruction. There's over-exploitation of natural resources, there's pollution, there's invasive species that are spreading uh, unusually in high numbers. And what we see uh, globally is really, really worrying. I mean, I've been an stu amateur student of history. I wrote two books related to history, but uh, from reading uh, lots of lots of uh, history books, I can... Uh, uh, kind of repeat that statement that history repeats itself once as uh, first as uh, tragedy and second as farce. Uh, and then we are as hum humans are unfortunately don't learn our lessons. Uh, now what is what is this and how does this all of this relate to our situation 
uh, how I want to tie these uh, bigger issues with the situation. Uh, let me just take a couple of examples. Climate change. Uh, did you know, for example, that in this last uh, almost four months now of genocide in Gaza, Israel actually, uh, its military alone, produced uh, more greenhouse gas emissions than um, than half the uh, any country in the lower half of the producers of greenhouse emissions just in four months. Uh, they produced more greenhouse emissions as military than uh, than many countries in Africa, like Angola or whatever, uh, Nigeria even, uh, which is a large African country, uh, because of all the bombing sorties, uh, continuous uh, development, the uh, continuous burning of things, uh, the destruction, uh, the bombs that produce greenhouse gas emissions, white phosphorus and its burns, etc. The environmental impact alone of this war in Gaza has been catastrophic. And as you probably heard from previous speakers, I'm sure that Gaza was intended to be to become unlivable. That's the main goal of Israel, not the destruction of Hamas, by the way, is to make Gaza unlivable, which they have succeeded in achieving to a large extent in 50% of the land of Gaza. So I just took the example of climate change to show, to show you the nexus between uh, wars, conflict, and, uh, and an issue that should concern all of us, which is climate change. I can take the same thing with pollution and speak about all the polluting substances that depleted uranium, the, um, the white phosphorus, the destruction of the aqua, uh, you know the the uh, um, the underground aquifer and so on uh, in Gaza. Uh, I could endlessly speak about you know the the destruction in terms of that aspect. The other aspect that you know people don't realize that's not easily fixable. Also, even if the environment is possible to rebuild. You rebuild uh, 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 residential buildings or universities or whatever, but if you destroy uh, uh, valuable um, cultural, historical, and natural habitats, uh, and, you know, 160 some mosques were destroyed, three churches, uh, of course, many universities in Gaza, many museums were destroyed. Uh, cultural artifacts that are priceless have been lost. This is not something you can recoup very easily. Uh, you know, you can reconstruct some things and others you cannot. But the the point I'm trying to make is there's, there's irreparable damage to these wars. And this genocide is not unusual. By the way, there are genocides in the hundreds just in the past few hundred years an average of one genocide every two or three years, uh, a Holocaust or a genocide in some parts of the globe or another. And the U.S. has been the biggest, as Martin Luther King said, the biggest purveyor of violence in the world. Uh, it committed genocides in Vietnam and Cambodia and Iraq and Yemen through proxies, of course, Saudi Arabia and uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, by the way, are worse than uh, than many other countries you can think of um, in terms of their oppressions and in terms of uh, they are actually now saving Israel because there's a land bridge that uh, to bypass the uh, uh, Yemen's uh, control of Israeli shipping through the Red Sea and through the Gulf of Aden. Uh, so to bypass this Israeli ships or Israel bound ships are going to the United Arab Emirates and then they unload their ships there and then there's trucks that carry those uh, supplies to Israel from UAE through Saudi Arabia, through Jordan to uh, the uh, northern uh, bridge, uh, uh, Sheikh Hussein Bridge in the West Bank. Uh, cross directly into Israel. Without this uh, lifeline, basically Israel would have folded a long time ago. 
uh, under the uh, situation of pressure of, uh, of the resistance in Gaza and so on. This is a global problem. This is not an Israel uh, versus Palestine problem. It is part and parcel of the U.S. Uh, and NATO hegemony in the world. That's why NATO went into Libya. That's why the U.S. went into Iraq. It's uh, reshaping the Middle East, reshaping the world to ensure hegemony of the U.S. slash Israel. And I say the U.S. slash Israel because it's not that Israel serves U.S. imperial interests. No, Israel is an imperial power now. It's outreach actually competing with Americans, weapons manufacturers to other countries. And so Israel is uh, uh, even controlling U.S. foreign policy to a large extent. I would say 90 percent of U.S. foreign policy decisions, even in Latin America or in South Africa or in anywhere else, are shaped in Tel Aviv, not in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and so... You know we have a we have a huge problem, so I I depressed you enough and I don't have much time. So I want to just talk two sentences about solution, what we have to do. Number one, without resistance, you will not get anywhere. Without the resistance, you will not get anywhere, and the American public needs to resist. The American public is being duped by thinking that their choice is between one senile uh, idiot and another senile idiot, uh, while the actual power structure is from other people. This, is, this, is, uh, this has to change, and the American public need to be aware of how much their government lied to them. They lied to them about weapons of mass destruction, about... Uh, you know, they all the wars that they entered into were based on lies and not based on American interests. They were based on interests of a select group of uh, special interests, military, industrial, or Zionist interests. Uh, so the American public need to be awakened. The world public needs to be awakened. Europe is waking up. Unfortunately, their politicians, like the American politicians, they are appointed not uh, through what's called democracy. There's no democracy. Uh, that's a word from Greek, by the way. It means that the people, demos and crashes, the people uh, that, that have the decision-making, the people don't have decision-making process in this. And that needs to change. Uh, we need to democratize the West. The same thing for the Israeli public, by the way, who thinks they have democracy, even for Jews, as it is. Uh, obviously, it's apartheid for the Palestinians. But even for Jews, they think that they have a power. Uh, but really, Netanyahu, Gallant, uh, Lapid, all these people, the white Ashkenazi Jews that are uh, from the beginning have ruled Israel uh, from behind the scenes and determined what goes on. Uh, that's who runs Israel, not uh, a point of elections or anything else. Um, Israel is losing this war. The US is trying to save it with the help of Britain now, but uh, increasingly other countries are shying away from this help. Um, so we need to speak truth to power. We need to challenge this hegemony. We need to support the axis of resistance that includes Yemen, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, increasingly. The U.S. is also going to lose in Ukraine, by the way, uh, is already losing in Ukraine. Um, and not that I like Russia or anything else, because Russia is also um, a key partner in imperial power that established Israel. The U.S. and uh, Russia, USSR at the time, were the first two countries to recognize this illegitimate um, implant in the middle of the Arab and Islamic world called the Jewish State of Israel, which is intended to keep dividing the Arab world and the Muslim world into sections, duking it out, fighting each other, etc. So, and and uh, what what we have to understand is. Uh, our enemies are many. Uh, 
uh, including governments like Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, they're all puppets. Uh, we we need to to work on the uh, head of the snake, which is Israel, the United States slash Israel. And that's where we have to focus our energies on the people. The people can make a difference in countries like the U.S. If you remember, I'm a U.S. citizen and I consider it my second country. That's how we got the women's right to vote. That's how we ended the war in Vietnam. That's how we stopped U.S. support of apartheid South Africa, how we got civil rights, how we got uh, social security. All the good things that happened in the U.S. happened from people movement. And there could be a people movement in the U.S. that changes the dynamics and stops this imperialism. Thank you very much. Sorry if I took a little longer. Thank you so much. Dr. Mazen speaking to us from occupied Bethlehem, including for reminding us about this profound and inextricable connection between ecocide and genocide, which has so often been lost in the discussion amid all of the horrors that are have been we've seen unfolding in Gaza over the last month. Next, we are so honored to have with us Professor Gayatri Spivak of Columbia University. Again, someone else who needs no elaborate introduction. Her work has shaped so much uh, and so for so many of us, the work that we do. Professor Spivak, thank you for joining us today. Um, turn it over to you. Gayatri Spivak? Um, um, maybe one of the other organizers could message Professor Spivak. And in the meantime, uh, we are also very honored to have here with us a uh, distinguished law professor and expert on international law, uh, Michael Link, former U.S., uh, former U.N., sorry, U.S., U.N., a bit of a Freudian slip, uh, former U.N. Special Rapporteur for Palestine. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much for having me and thank you very much for organizing this. Um, I just have a few words um, with respect uh, to the issue of the uh, suspension of funding to, uh, to UNRWA. Um, it, it may have already been said, I haven't been able to watch the entire event today, um, but UNRWA is absolutely indispensable uh, to addressing the humanitarian catastrophe that's going on now in Gaza. Only UNRWA is in the position of being able to capably um, uh, distribute the um, in, in humanitarian aid required to get into Gaza to be able to look after the needs of the more than 2 million Palestinians who've been left homeless, displaced, um, and without access to food, water, fuel, uh, in some cases tents, uh, and, uh, and so on. Let's keep in mind what UNRWA does. In Gaza, uh, it has over 13,000 employees who service around uh, one and a half million Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Uh, around 70% of the Palestinians in Gaza are, um, um, are refugees, according to uh, UNRWA's UN definition with respect to this. Um, and it has very strict rules with respect to impartiality and the non-involvement in politics. Uh, it does not operate in a risk-free zone, um, and we have to understand that, uh, particularly uh, given the fact that um, Gaza has been ruled by a military authority over the last 15 years and um, yeah, frequently subjected to uh, assaults on the, its population and on, on the territory uh, by Israel, all the while remaining under a 15-year um, uh, comprehensive blockade air, sea, and land. So for the life of me, I don't understand the decision by a number of the funding, funding uh, countries, all of them in the global north, North America and in Europe, to suspend their funding. That amounts to about 60% of, uh, of the annual budget of, uh, of UNRWA. Um, the number of employees who are alleged to have taken play part in the October 12th attack, I believe is 12. That was based on allegations coming from Israel. Um, that is one-tenth of one percent 
of the 13,000 employees in uh, in Gaza. The suspension of the funding not only affects the ability of UNRWA to be able to deliver humanitarian aid at a time when its needs are so crucial uh, in the uh, in Gaza, but it also affects its entire operations in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Lebanon, Syria, and uh, and Jordan. Um, its work is indispensable for keeping the head the head of Palestinians in Gaza above water to the to the degree possible uh, with regards to this. And let's keep in mind um, that this is by far the most scrutinized uh, uh, agency or organization in the UN system, primarily because it stands as a symbol um, uh, and a remembrance of the darkest moment in Palestinian history, which is the expulsion of around a million Palestinians in 1948 and again in 1967. Let's also keep in mind that UNRWA has lost approximately 152 staff members since the war began in early October. This is by far by far the largest number of UN staff members who've been killed in a conflict since the origins of the uh, uh, of the United Nations in 1945. Um, last week, uh, the foreign minister of uh, of Israel, Israel Katz, said that it had been warning for years that UNRWA perpetuates uh, the refugee issue, that obstructs peace, and that it serves as the civilian arm of Hamas in Gaza. Besides being a outrageous uh, comment, that's like blaming food banks for homelessness and uh, and poverty. Uh, yeah, uh, and it also reveals, I think, what uh, Israel's true aims and in its public statements with respect to the uh, uh, it wanting to see the end of uh, of UNRWA is that it perpetuates the uh, refugee issue. It certainly does stand, I guess, in many ways, as the right of Palestinians exercise their ability to return to their homes or in their homelands. This was guaranteed in a UN resolution of the General Assembly in December 1948. Uh, 75 years ago, and it's been passed as a resolution by the General Assembly almost every year since uh, then. This is the most reaffirmed resolution, the most reaffirmed uh, specific issue in the history of the uh, of the United Nations. Um, and the last thing I want to be able to point out is, you know, the desperate need right now that UNRWA is in the forefront of trying to address. Um, in its decision on Friday, the International Court of Justice, uh, with respect to the its ruling on the provisional measures asked for by South Africa and its application against Israel with respect to the issue of genocide, the International Court of Justice found that many people in Gaza have no access, and I'm quoting, no access to the most basic foodstuffs, potable water, electricity, essential medicines, or heating, and the court ordered Israel to allow more supplies to enter Gaza immediately uh, in order to be able to meet the overwhelming humanitarian aid there. It is said uh, recently by uh, uh, world humanitarian organizations that 80% of the hunger and starvation right now in the world is uh, the people suffering from that are, are in Gaza. Uh, so the need for uh, need for Gaza and uh, for UNRWA and its work has never been greater. And can I remind uh, people that on this uh, that this has become the politics of distraction with respect to um, the spotlight suddenly being put on uh, on UNRWA? Why is it with uh, a complex organization of over thirty thousand employees all together in their operations throughout the Middle East, with respect to the allegations of twelve employees? that all of a sudden all of these major Global North funders with strong ties to Israel suspend their funding to, uh, to UNRWA when on the same day that these allegations arose last Friday, the ICJ released its decision saying that, there, that South Africa had established a plausible case of genocide against Israel. I didn't hear any of these same countries say because of the ruling of the, uh, of the International Court of Justice with respect to that on the plausible case of genocide, that they were going to review their diplomatic relations with Israel, uh, reassess their trade relations with Israel and reassess the arms trade with Israel. All, all of it you would have thought would be uh, arising from the same measuring stick that it says is now applying to UNRWA. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, best of luck with respect to the 
uh, role of the uh, of this wonderful international rally today, and I'm very honored to have taken part. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Michael Link. We're honored that you could benefit us with your expertise, born of such long stalwart expert work on Palestine as the special rapporteur on the occupied Palestinian territories. Thank you so much, Michael. Professor Spivak, we're going to um, turn to you next. I've already introduced Professor Spivak, uh, but she's already known and loved to so many of us. Uh, Professor Spivak, um, your words, please. I don't think uh, I don't think Professor Spivak can hear you. Professor um, Bianca, can you continue messaging Professor Spivak? Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, we are going uh, to hear from um, Palestinian poet Dr. Abdul Fattah Abu Surur live from Occupied Palestine. Um, he is a poet, an arts educator, and a civil society leader. We are honored and grateful that you are here with us today. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Fattah. Thank you kindly and good evening, everybody, or good morning, wherever you are. Um, my name is Abdel Fattah, Abdel Karim, Hassan, Ibrahim, Muhammad, Ahmed, Mustafa, Ibrahim, Mahmoud, Surur, Abu Surur. The reason I'm saying that is that I am the 11th generation and the first to be born in a refugee camp in my own country, Aida refugee camp. My parents come from two of the villages that were occupied and destroyed in 1948. And I was born in one of 58 refugee camps which were established after this tragedy that we call Nakba. I am the 14th child in a family that have lost 10 of its children between 1948 to 1963. I'm the youngest of four alive. And I, being born in a refugee camp in your own country seemed paradoxical, but hit, here we are still 75 years later, still in, with these, within these refugee camps with our old rusty keys for doors that do not exist anymore, mostly, but we reclaim that right of return because it is our right. It's not a dream. It's not a, a, a begging for charity. It's not a right of occupier to erase our memory, our home, our right, and so on. I established our Rwad Cultural and Art Society to inspire hope and promote life for children. And uh, so I would say that UNRWA is a testimony of the existence of Palestinian refugees. It has been targeted since 1994 by the Israeli occupation that they want to end it and say that there is no refugees anymore. But continuously, they continue their ethnic cleansing and continue with making new refugees every day since their existence. I will, write, will read you a poem that I wrote concerning what is happening. It's called, This is Not a Tsunami. This is not a tsunami. It's not a natural catastrophe or an earthquake. This is where palms were high in the sky, houses built with sweat and joy. These uh, were the narrow alleys to our, of our childhood, where we used to play football, hide and seek, and again, games of freedom, fighters, and occupation army. This is where we used to walk for dawn prayers, walk on the beach to breathe the sea. This is where we used to have our fun hours. When the sun calms down, it's anger and despair. This was Gaza, proud and ready to be the bride on her wedding night. What remains of the white dress are shreds of fog enveloping torn up souls. What happens here is not a tsunami. It's not an earthquake. It's not locusts that passed by and destroyed all what was under their wings. What happened here is a genocide deliberate destruction and killing of innocent spirits. Children lived the tragedies that no children of their age 
have witnessed in such short life. What happened here are war and crimes by Zionist bandits of terror who, who created a legend of horror and hatred and built their future in erasing every other existence. What happened here is official silence and complicity and a genocide with open eyes and ears with no shame and no fear. From experts of terrorism and atrocities under all these cold ruins were warm laughs, hugs and whispers and new clothes for Eid celebration after the fasting month of Ramadan. Under these miserable remains were joyful drawings and books of dreams and poems of hope and love. Under these destroyed houses hide family secrets and all the treasures of people's memory where newborns have seen the light under bombardments and martyred corpses took their journey to the other side of life. This was Gaza, a bride of a pride. This is Gaza, proud of its resistance. This is Gaza after war, war criminals committed their genocide. This is Gaza and its people standing steadfast. This is Gaza, still alive. This is Gaza, where occupations died. And I will, if I have time, I'll do another one. Another century, another decade, another year, another month, another week, another day, another night, another hour, another minute, another second, another sound, another lost and found, another sight, another bite, another fight, another heartbeat, another defeat, another breath, another death, another oppression, another injustice. Another hypocrisy, another complicity, another duplicity, another conspiracy, another deportation, another occupation, another violation, another humiliation, another tragedy, another apartheid, another colony, another UN resolution, another decision, another revision, another promise, promise, promise another arrogance, another ignorance, another declaration another defamation, another segregation, another isolation, another dictation, another Nakba, ongoing Nakba, and yet ongoing Nakba. Yet we are here. We are here. We are here standing bigger than mountains, stronger than the oppressor, braver than the occupier, deeply rooted in this land of Palestine. We don't weep on our misery. We don't solicit your pity. We resist the humanization and violation we master the, and the wisdom of resistance. We love our children. We want them to grow up, change the world and create miracles. Be proud of their achievement. We want them to live for their country. We refuse injustice. We identify with those who suffer despite injustice forced on us. We are not blinded not to see the others oppressed. Do your vilest. We are here. Show your ugliest face. We are here. Test your final weapons. We are here. Experiment your latest destructive technology. We are here. Revolution, revolutionize all genocidal text, the tactics. We are here. Multiply lies. Dehumanize humanity. Unearth our earth. Do your vilest, practice your wickedest, steal our breath, own our main dish, we are here. Violate our space, we are here. Dry out the river and the sea, we are here. Assassinate our olives and oranges, we are here. Suffocate the perfume of sage and za'atar, we are here. Confiscate our last parcel of land, we are here. Bomb our last house, we are here. Don't you understand? You cultivate death. We outlive death. And yet we are here. How many hits to break the will of a hero? How many bombs should fall to dehumanize a people? How many years of occupation to erase a nation? How many oppressions to enslave the free? 
how many conspiracies to falsify history, how many lies to reshape our existence. Every image you see is ours. Every voice you hear is ours. Every sound in the air is ours. Every breath you take. is ours. Every harvest you take is ours. Every perfume you smell is ours. Every day you live is ours. Every day you come is ours. Every day, every resistance is ours. Every sumut is ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abdel Fattah, for those beautiful words, really moving, really important and powerful to have you here today. Thank you. I can see so many hearts going up on the screen. Um, thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your art and for sharing that with us. So next, we are going to hear from Susan Abulawa, um, a Palestinian writer, human rights advocate, and founder of Palestine Rights Festival. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> yes. Thank you to the organizers and, um, and all the contributors so far, in particular, um, Abdel Fattah's defiance, um, Lina's beautiful artistry and her poetry, and Mazen Khumsiya's uh, connecting of the dots between genocide, imperial designs, and the trashing of our planet. I believe that our greatest power as Palestinians lies in our creative expressions of our indigenous heritage and our ancient unbroken belonging to that patch of land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan waters. I also wanna thank those EU states that have refused to capitulate to American genocidal pressure, um, such as Spain, which has tripled their contributions to UNRWA in Belgium, Ireland, and Denmark. And to those who are actively resistant, resisting American hegemony, such as the brave and moral people of Yemen, South Africa, Mexico, Chile and Indonesia and others. And despite the purpose of this webinar, I can't focus solely on the defunding of UNRWA, which is just one piece of an ongoing active genocide being live streamed to the world over the past 108 days, 18 days. Against the backdrop of apocalyptic scenes of whole families and bloodlines being wiped from existence, of tens of thousands murdered in the most gruesome and horrifying ways, including being buried alive in the rubble of their homes or crushed under the weight of walls and ceilings that once contained generations of living and memories, some shredded or burned to death or to eternal suffering in this life or worse, dying slowly in the dark and cold because no one knows you're alive or cannot reach you. Against the backdrop of Israeli celebrations and glee over the ineffable suffering and pain of millions of human beings starving and suffering before our eyes, of babies and children living unimaginable trauma that will rewire their brains and psyches. Against the backdrop of an entire defenseless indigenous population getting crushed under the weight of a vile settler colony, military, militarized society with the most advanced death machines ever known. Against the backdrop of the most powerful men and women in the world openly calling for more of such inhumanity, more bloodshed, more terror, more displacement, more hunger, more thirst. You all heard the quotes submitted by the ICJ, but there are more, many more coming from ordinary Israelis and many more coming from American politicians, 
and the billionaire filth who owned them. Against this backdrop, nations and peoples of our world are slowly taking their positions on one side or another. I never thought I would quote Benjamin Mylikowski, also known as Benjamin Netanyahu, the Polish American Zionist colonizer and war criminal whose family name was changed to sound more indigenous to the region. He said this was a battle between light and darkness. And it is clear that it is indeed such, though not in the nefarious terms he described. It is a battle between violent colonialism and indigenous liberation, between the autonomy of the global south and the exploitations of the imperial violent global north it is a battle between ethno-religious supremacy and universal dignity, between genocide and accountable diplomacy. It is not an exaggeration to say that the outcome of this moment will determine the fate of humanity for many generations to come. We do not have to be slaves to the will of a minority of humans who wield and exercise extraordinary power over our lives, over our public discourse, over, over our our knowledge. We can create the world we want. We can become the world we want. We can end their endless wars, their coups, their regime changes, the violent chaos they exercise. We can impose justice in Palestine, in Congo and beyond. We can usher a new era of sustainable living and development of safety, not only for humans, but all creatures, because they too deserve to live their lives without mechanized human terror. It is all connected and all of our work for social, economic and environmental justice and all the incremental triumphs we've achieved over generations are coalescing at this moment of genocide. It is incumbent on everyone to take a stand. Those who remain silent and exercise their privilege to be uninvolved are in fact taking a stand for genocide and for this darkness. Every small effort matters, even if it is merely sharing or posting or reading a book to try to understand or giving a few dollars to UNRWA or the various other Palestinian efforts to survive. The world where we tread gently on this planet, where freedom is the self-evident basic nature and right of living beings, where agencies like UNRWA are no longer needed, in fact, to survive, and where oppression, exploitation, colonization, and the hoarding of wealth is utterly repudiated. This world at this moment begins in Gaza if we fight for it, or it will die in Gaza under Israeli bombs and American hegemonic greed if we allow it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan, for your moving words um, and for giving voice to the unimaginable suffering and the unspeakable violence um and naming the moment that we're in thank you for sharing your words with us uh, perspective um next up um i think many many of you are familiar with his work um we're going to be hearing from retired physician and best-selling author gabor mate welcome gabor my name is gabor but thank you very much <laughs> nobody welcome, nobody ever welcome, to... welcome gabor my bad welcome <laughs> thank you thank you uh, well, thanks for inviting me. Um, what to say? Um, this has been the heaviest time of my life, um, and that's saying a lot, because um, I've been traveling this earth for 80 years now, and um, I've seen many horrors, but there's something about right now that's unique in that we're seeing it in real time. We're seeing the destruction of human beings, the utter... Uh, war against children 
the maiming of young human beings, the destruction of an entire society. And we're seeing that cheered on and uh, justified by our politicians. And the perpetrator is portrayed as the victim. And the great Israeli historian, Ilan Papi, pointed that out, that, that the, um, the, the, the greatest outrage is that the victims are portrayed as the uh, perpetrators. The hypocrisy cries to the heavens. Let me read you something. This is Anthony Blinken, the uh, American um, Secretary of State. And he said in November, I spoke with you on our WA staff in Gaza, he wrote on Twitter. I heard about the extraordinary life-saving work they're doing in the face of extremely difficult conditions. We are working to expedite assistance to them that they can get it to the Palestinian people. Anthony Blinken said this as his country was arming and encouraging and um, enabling the massacre of the people that UNRWA was serving. Now, by total coincidence, quote unquote, just as the International Court of Justice issued its groundbreaking verdict, which called Israel to account for what it's been doing in Gaza, somehow, what a coincidence, it's announced that UNRWA is being investigated for participating in the October the 7th events. Where does the information come? And, and all these countries, Canada, the UK, Switzerland, the US, suspend aid to UNRWA. Where does the information come from? It comes from inter Israeli intelligence. How does Israeli intelligence obtain this information? Which they did report in Israel, which is not reported in the United States, by the interrogation of Gazan prisoners. Now, we know what the interrogation looks like because I've worked myself in the West Bank last year with Palestinians tortured in Israeli jails. And Israeli Physicians for Human Rights have documented for decades the torture of Palestinian prisoners. And this is the information that America, without even looking at it, accepts as persuasive. Not to mention Israeli intelligence found emails and Twitters and, you know. And what did they find? That maybe 13 out of the 12,000 Gazans who works for, work for UNRWA had ties to Hamas. So through these supposed uh, links that they found on various online um, documents and through the interrogation they found that maybe 1% or less, actually it's not even 1%, it's less, isn't it? One in a thousand of people working for you on Darbala in Gaza might have some ties to Hamas and might have participated. First of all, we don't even know if that's true. Secondly, even if it is, what's so surprising about that? What's so surprising about that, given what Israel has done to Gaza all these years? And what's that has to do with the organization? What does that have to do with this one um, institute that was created to expiate the guilt of the West to what it wrought in Palestine back in 1947-48 in assigning this country to immigrants from Europe who had their reasons to flee, but who had no right to take over the land from the Palestinians. And, and of course, UNRWA doesn't just work in Gaza, it works all over, over the Middle East with Palestinian refugees. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. And then today, the Biden administration announced that it's going to sanction West Bank settlers who permit violent who commit violent acts against the Palestinians. 
but it's not going to sanction the government that enables and arms and legally empowers those settlers to do what they do, whose policy those settlers are just carrying out. So what enrages me most as a, as a, as a Jew is that this is all being done in my name and in the name of my people. And anybody who dares to raise a voice in criticism, like that terrible anti-Semite Roger Waters, whose face I'm seeing on my screen here, you know, is subject subjected to calumny. And people like myself, you know, we're self-hating Jews, of course, we're traitors, we betrayed our people. So um, I salute everybody on this call. I salute everybody who speaks out because this, the hypocrisy is unbelievable. And the venom directed against critics of what's going on is proportionate to the horror of what's being perpetrated. So thank you all. Well, thank you. Uh, we salute you, uh, uh, Gabor. Thank you for your poignant words, for expressing the hypocrisy um, and insanity of this moment, um, this genocide. Um, Gabor Mate, such a pleasure to hear from you. Um, I want to remind people that the title of our rally is Defund Genocide, um, not Aid to the Genocided, and the hashtag is hashtag refund UNRWA, defund uh, genocide. Next up, we have... Uh, Oh, can I, can I say yes. something? Gabor, please. Just, yeah. just apropos to what you just said, I saw a great cartoon. Uh, maybe some of you saw it. It's Biden speaking, and he said, "We don't, we don't uh, negotiate with terrorists. We fund them." Ouch. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gabor Mate, everybody. Next up, we have musician Roger Waters joining us live. Welcome, Roger. Mute. Unmute. He shouted. I did unmute. Hey, Bianca. Hey, hey Roger. All, all the rest of you. All my friends. It's so good to be uh, back in Canada again. I was thinking of my friends in Vancouver from Independent Jewish Voices, and I'm thinking of Phil Fontaine and Uet Suet and, and all the people that I know and love in Canada. I'm actually in Barbados at the moment. I mustn't waste all my time talking about geography. Um, I'm a simple bass player, but I have got something to say. But I'm not, a, I wrote this down a minute ago, listening to Gabor, who's a hard man to follow. Simple bass player, but I'm not a simple man. I am complex and I'm damaged. My father died too. So I have empathy. And if I didn't have empathy, I would rather be dead. Okay, that's that. So this morning, I was writing a letter about the story that came out yesterday or the day before in Variety about how a record company has fired me because the ADL um, suggested that I was an anti-Semite. And so BMG, it's a German record company, refused to put out a new record I was making. And I've been writing a letter about that all, all, all this morning. I'm not going to read any of that because it's irrelevant to this conversation, except to say that in a way it's not because it's people like Jonathan Greenblatt at the ADL who have been trying to silence the voices of people who are complicated and have empathy in this conversation about the Zionist project in the Middle East. All right. ADL did it. ADL is an is a organization in the United States, the Anti-Defamation League. We all know them. I've known them since Abe Foxman was in short effing trousers, and that's a long time. Anyway, they, and uh, what they did was they got hold of this company called Bertelsmann, who owned this record company, and threatened to expose that they had uh, been involved with the Nazis in the Second World War. They'd printed leaflets for them, you know, in, in, joining in with the game of, of, uh, of um, destroying the Jewish population. I'm going to move on. The beginning of my letter, I called this, because I've got 
structure it now. The beginning of the letter says, and it quote, I quote, maybe Roger Waters was right all along. I know that sounds a bit self-obsessed and whatever, and maybe it is. So the end of my letter goes like this. I go, this is the last paragraph or two. There's a lot more detail to this grubby little story, but maybe the most important thing about this letter is in its title. Maybe Roger Waters was right all along. As far as attacks on me by the ADL and the CAA and all their ilk are concerned, the jury has been out for a long time, but it's not out anymore. The contention that I'm an anti-Semite because I've stood up against the attempted genocide of the indigenous people of Palestine is dead in the water. The people of the world have seen through the wall of hatred and the tissue of lies. There's no maybe I have been right all along about the Zionist enterprise in Palestine. I have. Since Zionism's inception in the mid-19th century, it has only been able to survive on the basis of lies and hatred. The biggest lie, of course, was a land without people for a people without land. Palestine was full of people before 1947, people of all races and religions, living side by side. They, the Palestinians, are the people of the Holy Land. The colonization and settlement of their land by another people who considered themselves superior was always a monstrous crime. For any group to consider themselves superior to another group and persecute them, like, for instance, the Nazis did to the Jewish people in the 30s and 40s, or like the Israelis have done since 1947 to the Palestinians, is an abominable expression of supremacist hatred and has no place on earth in the 21st century. I'm nearly done. No, lies and hatred won't cut it anymore, and the whole world knows it. Hang on, I've got to find my place. There is only one road to peace from the river to the sea, and that road will need to be paved with truth and love. I, here today, along with all my brothers and sisters from all over the world who I can feel standing beside me, will now together lay the first stone on that road to peace. Here it is. Like the Nakba, this paving stone dates back to 1948, to the 10th of December, 1948. It comes from Paris in France. It comes from the fledgling United Nations, first stretching its young wings. It is the 30 Articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I shall read the first and only the first of those 30 articles. Article one, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit brotherhood that's the end of my letter that's all right to say. thank you thank you roger very moving um and yes the whole world knows it 
Um, yeah, the, the whole world knows it. The whole world, the whole knows, world it. knows it. We the all know it. it is over. The experiment in the Holy Land, the Zionist endeavor is done. We just need to spread the word, that's all, and watch it happen. Okay, that's all I have to say. Love you all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. That was Roger Waters. Um, I just want to say thank you for speaking up. Thank you for your empathy. Thank you for being right all along. It's not easy, not at all. Uh, but, you know, if you can kill, if you can genocide, well, you can most certainly lie. Um, so we we have to all speak up against um, this genocide and for a free free Palestine, for a free Palestine. Next up, we have Shawan Jabarin, a Palestinian human rights defender and the general director of Al Haq, who is joining us live. Welcome, Shawan. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you to organizers. Uh, thank you all for your commitment to justice and support of the Palestinian struggle. The genocide the Palestinian people are facing uh, today is unprecedented in modern time. But genocide is nothing new to colonialism, which many peoples of the world have suffered. However, today we are supposed to have international law to protect us and ensure that the crimes of the past are not repeated. Unfortunately, despite the findings of the International Court of Justice around the credibility of the claim of genocide being committed in Gaza today, Many of the state, states which have the power to stop it are not only continuing to provide military, economic, and political support. Those same states are cutting off vital humanitarian aid by attacking the very agency which is a result of their colonial project. It's a clear that international law alone will not force states to do the right thing. That, powers, that power remains with you, the people. Our faith remains in the power of the people to give international law meaning, and every action you take makes a difference. We are confident that justice will eventually prevail and the shift in the direction of political will is within reach. However, <clears throat> however, this shift will not come to us willingly. We must force this shift through our collective efforts. Together, we are stronger than the force of oppression. <clears throat> When it's not enough to simply speak truth to power, we must take the power through individual and collective action that all leads to move states to change their position. Do not let anyone tell you that your efforts will not make a difference. Every action builds on the back of the other and eventually there will be the straw that breaks the back of this genocide. Thank you again, all of you, and I will look forward to welcoming you in Palestine soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Shawan. I just want to draw um, people's attention to the fact that there is an action uh, that you can take to support the world, the work of uh, of Al Haq um, that we are going to be posting in the chat. Um, so please do please do take action if you are in Canada. Oh, my apologies. Uh, my video has has not been started. OK, hopefully you can see me now. Um, and uh, yeah, and to just let people know that it's really important to stay involved, stay engaged. Um, I'm now going to call upon our tech person to see if we can play the video from Nora Arakat. Uh, can we play the video? Yes. Is that Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, the attack on UNRWA is incredibly cynical. On the day that the international community received word and notice that it shouldn't be aiding and abetting genocide, rather than end weapons transfers to the, the state accused of genocide and com plausibly committing it, the United States in concert with Australia and Canada waged a campaign against UNRWA and, and, and the Palestinians who are most in need of humanitarian aid for survival by now helping to starve them, thereby being complicit uh, in, in genocide. And I just want to you know, emphasize that this is as much about a deflection from the ICJ decision, perpetuation of Israel's genocide campaign um, and punishment for to the UN and its judicial organ and having the audacity to, to you know, charge Israel with genocide as much as it is a continuation of an Israeli goal of invisibilizing Palestinians, not just by saying they don't exist as Palestinians juridically, but also insisting that as there, there are no refugees and they do not have the right to return, framing them as an existential threat because of the, the you know, disrupting the demographic balance um, and, and, and trying to do that through many means by limiting who's entitled to the right of return, by limiting that temporally, by limiting it geographically. And now what we're seeing is by, you know, trying to decimate the very organ the very organ that was established um, even before UNHCR, the, the, the International Refugee Agency that services this, uh, this population that is in need. It's literally punishing them for continuing to exist and trying to annihilate them through other means. That was the legendary Nora Eric Hatt, Palestinian human rights lawyer and scholar. Uh, many thanks to Nora for, for sending that message to us today. Next, we're gonna hear from Omar Harami, uh, director of Sabil Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center in Jerusalem. Welcome, Omar. Thank you, it's an honor for me to be a participant in such an amazing event. I really didn't know what to say. I mean, it's just one more bad decision made by the international community or the powerful among the decision makers. Again, it's another uh, red line being crossed in Palestine. I personally, like many, have lost hope in decision makers around the world. I don't think that there is any wisdom or courage among the decision makers. And logically, when you have a crisis with so many bad decisions being made, I think our energy should not be placed on changing decisions, but changing decision makers. That's what all revolutions have always been part of. So if we want to create a new leadership, we need to start by building a group of people who keep a single standard unlike the hypocrisy that we are experiencing um, today in the world. We also need to hold the people in power accountable. Everybody should distance themselves from the leaders and their crimes. We need to expose the bad leaders. UNRWA was established. UNRWA does important work. But let's be frank with each other. It was established to improve the conditions of the Palestinians inside the cage to keep us well-fed refugees, refugees who have access to education, refugees to have um, access to food or clean water. It was not established for refugees to go home to the houses and to the homes and to the lands that they have been dispossessed from. I strongly believe today, like many Palestinians, that it is we are no longer interested in improving the conditions in the cage. We no longer want the cage. We want to genuinely be free. And we want not only for us to be free, we want to be part of a movement that liberates everybody who is oppressed around the world. And maybe not only the, to liberate the people who are oppressed, but also liberate our oppressors too. 
So to create new leadership so that we no longer do bad decisions, so that we no longer cross the red lines, so we no longer create gaps between the people that we are supposed to be representing and the people um, that we must serve. So I hope that the, the solidarity movements all around Palestine, we continue to coordinate, cooperate, to show the world that we are not the powerless. We are very powerful. And we're going to hold people accountable and we're going to come and chase every decision maker, every war criminal accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Omar Harami. And inshallah to dismantling this cage altogether from Turtle Island to Palestine. Now, words from Occupy Turtle Island. I think Aziza may be frozen. Um, so I'm just gonna call on um, the video for Leanne uh, Simpson that we uh, were gonna be playing earlier. The, the video, please. Ani Kinawaya, Gitagabizuna Denawema, Kinagichi and Ishnavakogaming Nadonjaba, Nagojawani Megwadoda, Gidas Musaki Nadijnakas. Canada is founded upon the genocide of Indigenous nations. It removed Indigenous peoples from our homelands through murder, imposed starvation and poverty, harm, forced sterilization, and the removal of generations of children from families and into the residential school system from 1880 to 1996, where they were tortured, starved, raped, beaten, prohibited from speaking their language and practicing their religion, and where many of them died. There are currently more children in the child welfare system than at the height of the residential school system. Indigenous women, girls, transgender, gender diverse, and two-spirit people continue to go missing at an alarming and disproportionate rate. And despite making up only 4% of the population in Canada, Indigenous women account for 42% of all federally sentenced and incarcerated women in the country. From the Indian Act to the creation and maintenance of the reserve system to the police that show up when we are defending our lands from pipelines, golf courses, clear cuts and mining, Canada supports genocide because Canada exists because of genocide. International law didn't prevent it, the UN didn't prevent it, and Canada's legal system for the most part supports it. The Canadian state has engaged in a process of truth and reconciliation and watching Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister Jalais support Israel, support genocide, and now withdraw UNRWA funding means both truth and reconciliation were always a sham. We are still here and we are still fighting and to my Palestinian siblings in Gaza, in the West Bank, in 48, and in the diaspora, I will fight for you too. The settler state that dispossesses and occupies our lands supports Israel in dispossessing and occupying Palestine. I encourage Indigenous peoples worldwide to, to visit indigenousforpalestine.org to sign our letter of solidarity and to commit to the Palestinian call to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel and all institutions complicit in Israeli apartheid and settler colonialism. I encourage you all to organize mutual aid for Palestine and for Gaza to demand freedom for political prisoners and to support land back and the right of return for Palestinians. I demand that Prime Minister Trudeau reinstate Canada's UNRWA funding and demand the return of Mansur Schumann, a Palestinian Canadian citizen believed to be abducted by the IDF a few days ago. To close, I will echo what Palestinians have been saying for decades. Stop the genocide, end the siege, end the occupation, dismantle apartheid, free Palestine. Miigwech. 
Beautiful words from Leanne Simpson, making the important connections between indigenous struggles on Turtle Island and in Palestine, um, and reminding us here uh, in Canada of our complicity. Um, thanks to Leanne for that, uh, for that important message. Next, we're going to be hearing um, from Burmese genocide scholar, uh, Rohingya solidarity activist and dissident in exile, Mong Zarni. Welcome, Mong. I think you're still muted, uh, Mong. Can you hear me? Still, still, still muted here. I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Um, yeah, perfect. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to all the colleagues um, who organized the event. And also, I want to thank my uh, uh, the Rohingya brother who is handling the tech. Um, just a couple of points. Um, I approach the um, <laughs> Palestinian uh, second Nakba from three different human perspectives. I came from Burma. We were under the British colonial rule for 124 years. And I mentioned this because my ancestors who attempted to resist the British colonizers, they were termed terrorists, the Koids, rebels, you name it. Much more recently, Nelson Mandela was termed terrorist. Let's just remind ourselves. From the colonial perspective, and in the colonizing language, the language of the colonizers, all resistors are terrorists. So when we talk about UNRWA, UNRWA and the um, 12 alleged uh, staff that were involved or we were told by the New York Times and the like, in the, in the violent attacks by Hamas on October 7. I think that is in line with centuries of colonizing narrative. So in resisting the colonial <clears throat> project that continues on after 500 years, including 400 years of slavery and transatlantic state. We must first fight to free ourselves from this narrative of terrorism. If you look at the situation, the battle lines have been redrawn. Current imperialist state of the United States that had replaced Britain at the end of the Holocaust or Second World War, and formerly colonizing states, including Japan. They are on one side and the rest of us, despite our skin color and geographic locations, people of conscience and compassion are on the other side. This is the struggle. This is a struggle that goes beyond Palestine. As you know, in 1967, Reverend Martin Luther King delivered his famous, very analytical and impassioned speech beyond Vietnam, connecting all the dots, the deprivation of civil rights to the African-American people, to debts of millions of Vietnamese people who attempted to fight back the U.S. invasion. So firstly, we must ask, who is calling whom terrorist? This is beyond hypocrisy. This is not about hypocrisy. This is about Orwellian. Secondly, I approach this subject as a student of genocide. I've conducted genocide study tours, walking tours in various places, including at Auschwitz and also uh, in Kamar Rouge killing fields for a number of years. I've been to at least six death camps, Nazi camps in Poland and Germany. 
every time I step into these dark sides, whether they're Srebrenica or Phnom Penh or Auschwitz or Dachau, my heart aches and pains. And it doesn't ask for the identity or, le or legal standing or nationality of any victims. It pains. It, I, because I'm a human with the capacity to feel compassion and I have a conscience and I have a mind, I see through what's going on. Thirdly, Roger Waters talk about Zionist project being dead. I fully agree because we see through. Just go and pick up a copy of Golda Meir's My Life as the only Israeli female prime minister. 475 pages. She detailed the building of Israel out of this total lie. Land without people for the people without land. And she detailed that even 1947 UN partition was accepted grudgingly and as a matter of tactic, is a tactical choice by Ben-Gurion and others who were involved in building the state of Israel in 1947 and 48. And Maya was one of the signers of the declaration of the establishment of the state of Israel on 14th of May, 1948, just a month before that Israel was declared independent by Golda Meir, Ben-Gurion, and others, Albert Einstein wrote this letter dated April 10, 1948, to the gentleman named Shepard Rifkin, executive director, American Friends of the Fighters, for the freedom of Israel. I quote, Dear sir, when a real and final catastrophe should befall us in Palestine, the first responsible for it would be the British because the British were in charge. It was the British mandate. And the second responsible for it, the terrorist organizations built up from our own ranks. I am not willing to see anybody associated with those misled and criminal people. These are the words of Albert Einstein. I just put in my essay a URL in the chat box. It's called Israel has a right to exist, but not as genocidal expansionist state. And secondly, Zionism comes with... Uh, a strategy, a strategy to expand, all going back all the way to 1906 when David Ben-Gurion arrived in the land of Palestine. And five days before the Genocide Convention was adopted, on the 9th of December, 1948, Einstein and about one dozen Jewish intellectuals wrote a, and published a letter signed on the 2nd of December, 1948, and New York Times published the letter two days later, on the 4th of December. Genocide Convention was adopted on the 9th of December, the same year. Independent, let me quote, you can easily Google it. In their letter, they wrote, among the most disturbing political phenomena of our times, is the emergence in the newly created state of Israel of the Freedom Party, a political party closely akin in its organization, method, political philosophy, and social appeal to the Nazi and fascist parties. It was formed out of the membership and following of the former Ergens v. Limi, a terrorist right-wing chauvinist organization in Palestine, unquote. And that organization today rules Israel as Likud Party. Its founder and founding chair was Menachem Begum. Finally, let me end with a quote that Raphael Lumpkin, 
who coined the term genocide in in his classic genocide about 18 pages long chapter very substantial articulation of what genocide is published in 1944 this is the, my last quote and then i will end and then i will tell you who the where the quote came from in starting we are obliged to depopulate he went on emphatically as part of our mission of preserving the german population we shall have to develop a technique of depopulation. If you ask me what I mean by depopulation, I mean the removal of the entire racial unit. And that is what I intend to carry out. That roughly is my task. Nature is cruel. Therefore, we too must may be cruel. If I can send the flower of the German nation into the hell of war, without the smallest pity for the spilling of precious German blood, then surely I have the, remo the right to remove millions of an inferior race that breeds like vermin. By remove, I don't necessarily mean destroy. I shall simply take systematic measures to damn their great natural fertility. Unquote. That is from the voice of destruction by Hermann Rauschen, who was a friend of Adolf Hitler. And, and the quote came from Adolf Hitler and Raphael Lumpkin put that verbatim quote, actually even lengthier than this, in his footnote number 29, page 86, chapter nine, genocide, from a, a, a huge volume called Exodus Rule. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mong Zarni, for taking us through that deeper colonial history that underlies the current moment, including for reminding us that the very discourses that states like Israel use to deflect accusations of genocide, i.e. that they are simply fighting quote unquote terrorism, far from being the opposite of genocide, have in fact been one of the primary vehicles for structurally genocidal uh, settler colonialism from Palestine to Kashmir to Standing Rock. Thank you, um, Dr. Mongzarni. Uh, our last um, live speaker before we turn to a poetry performance by uh, the amazing Elle Jones is Rabbi David Mivasir, unflagging activist for peace and justice. Rabbi David. And thank you so much, Aziza and uh, Bianca and Karen Rodman and others in the background. Just so appreciate you bringing us together and enabling us to share with so many other people around the world. I so appreciate what everyone has said. I've learned so much today. And I am um, thinking about what can I offer? What can I say? You know, I want to come to this conversation really as a Jew and as a rabbi and also as someone who used to be a Zionist, a, a liberal progressive Zionist, at least give myself credit for that. But through the years, actually through decades, I've I've learned and reoriented myself very much. And what I, you know, when I'm thinking about UNRWA, an agency established to support Palestinian refugees, what I have to acknowledge is that there would not be any Palestinian refugees unless Jews had driven them out from their homes, destroyed their homes, and never let them come back. Like, what is the root and the basis, the historical origin of why they're even, why, why are any Palestinians refugees at all? Where did that come from? We have to remember that, of course. I doubt anybody here would forget, but I just want to say it out loud. That's because of what some Jewish people did, um, 1947, 1948, even 1949, and then again in 1969. So that is, that's why there's an UNRWA in the first place. Another thing, as has been said, it was said so um, articulately by, uh, I think it was uh, Shawan Jabarin, maybe I'm confusing exactly who said it, but UNRWA was established to 
keep Palestinians as refugees and not let them come back home again. I, I just read a tweet a few days ago that I'm, I had to react to, I could not hold myself back. A Canadian Zionist wrote this, the notion that the entirety of the free world is responsible for giving billions of dollars to UNRWA in perpetuity, regardless of their conduct, is very bizarre, a form of entitlement I've never seen before. So my reaction was, UNRWA won't be needed when Palestinians return to their home country and build their economy as free people living in equality and democracy from the river to the sea. You're thinking that UNRWA will need funding in perpetuity says more about you than it does about anyone else. So I just want to embrace a few things. Clearly, as a Jewish person, just go back to the Bible. I imagine everyone here has heard of the Ten Commandments. I'll just repeat three of them. Lo tirtzach, do not murder. Lo tignov, thou shalt not steal. Lo tahmod, do not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's field, right? So exactly how does Zionism line up with Judaism? It's obviously really a contradiction to some of the foundations of Judaism. Another foundation of Judaism is the possibility of what we call teshuva, which sometimes in English gets called repentance, that people can change what they do. People can reevaluate their actions. They can look at what have they been doing and how has that impacted other people. And they can change it. And they need to. And that is like the key to progress in the world. Teshuva, changing, you know, how we behave. So just one other thing I just want to say kind of a point is I, I heard a Professor Michael Hart in this um webinar maybe an hour ago talk about in North America and Europe um, Jewish people getting more and more involved in supporting the Palestinian people's efforts to maintain their own existence and to you know restore themselves to their rightful place in the world and I just um, I want to name organizations in case anyone here is not aware perhaps you can connect with these organizations as if you haven't yet so one that I'm an active member of that I think is very important is called Jewish Voice for Peace that is in the United States. It's <laughs> Before October 7th, we had over 200,000 members. This organization, I have to say, I have very mixed feelings that it has grown so much, right? Jewish Voice for Peace is just so many Jews are joining it. I wish there was no pause for more people to join it, but it's become a much larger and more influential organization. In Canada, where I actually live, we have another organization called Independent Jewish Voices. And if you're in Canada and you wanna join us, support us, connect with us, look for ijvcanada.org. And um, I think, you know, I don't wanna to take too much time. I just, I wanna just share two more things. Just put, put this on the record. Oh, I read years ago that David Ben-Gurion said about the Palestinian people, the old will die off and the young will forget. And if anyone should know how untrue that is, it is exactly us Jewish people. As we look back on our own history, we know our history. We know where the kings of the Jewish people lived. We know where the prophets of the Jewish people live. We know where our Torah and our Bible were written. All of that is in the land that we call the land of Israel. We have also called it Palestine. And some of us have been away from there through our family histories for 2,000 years. Did we forget? Why would anybody think the Palestinians will forget? That's just not going to happen. So our job, really, as people of conscience and as actually as Jews who are loyal to Judaism and Jewish ethics, our job is to turn things around and to support the Palestinian people. Again, in 
in, in their return to their rightful place on this earth and their rightful place in history. And um, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. I really appreciate so much all the work that everyone here does in so many different ways, each of us showing up as ourselves. And I'm grateful that you've been, you know, you've 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 allowed me to bring my voice into this conversation as well. So thank you very much and God bless you all. Thank you, Rabbi David, for those comments breathing light and life into these beautiful Jewish principles of justice, which I know I, as a Muslim, also find so much resonance and beauty in. And thank you for also um, upping the work of vital organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, Independent Jewish Voices. I know we have people tuning in here, um, whether here or on the YouTube live stream from all over the world. So wherever uh, you are in other places, please also free to uh, put the names of other um, organizations and other actions that are happening where you are right now. Uh, now we are really um, fortunate to um, end this portion of our program with a new live performance of a poem by black feminist abolitionist, poet, scholar, prison justice activist, L. Jones. Thank Al. you. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm actually going to beg indulgence and do two, but they'll be back to back very quickly. They sit in their newsrooms with their mics and their wires. Night by night, all they bring us are one-sided liars. BBC's bias, they don't even hide it, shouldn't surprise us. They're all colonizers. Don't get on the air unless you sing in their choir one by one, all the Muslim journalists fired and Palestine's children are burning in fire, while protesters arrested for putting up flyers. Arrest us for chance, from the sea to the river, every word that we use ends up forbidden. They say Palestinians aren't even existing. Trudeau thinks that genocide surely a winner. They called the police for interrupting their dinner. Our politicians take money to visit the killers. They go on vacation, so now they stay quiet while Palestine's children are burning in fire. They're sending our taxes to weapon sellers and buyers. Every day of this occupation, their profits go higher. We send our police to be trained by advisors who roam the West Bank as terrorizers. And inside Israel's prisons are thousands of minors and women imprisoned without even a trial, living with checkpoints inside of those wires. They cut off the food and all the supplies and no anesthesia for surgery either if you show any joy you just might expire. They're adding the doctors to funeral pyres. They're killing the journalists and banning the writers. And even the olives on the branches are dying. They tell us their plans are to leave no survivors. They say no one is innocent, not even in diapers. So Palestine's children are burning in fire. Israel resumed bombing and dropping their shells. They've kidnapped more people to put in their cells. In the West Bank, where no Hamas dwells, a pregnant woman, they say, is a two-for-one kill. And who's there to stop them? Nobody can tell. Biden's all in saying Gaza farewell. The ICJ ruling won't even compel. And we voted for settlements at the UN. And we'll keep saying Israel's right to defend while every 10 minutes, another child dead. And if you play soccer, they'll shoot for your legs. Shireen Abu Akhle, they shot in the head and they'll wage all this war without our consent. So be careful what products you buy off the shelves. Don't let propaganda put you under a spell. And I hope Henry Kissinger's burning in hell with all the war criminals who run this empire will force all these murdering scumbags to retire because Palestine's children are dying in fire. And I'm going to do one more very quickly. Thank you. They want us defeated, removed and deleted and then not to speak it to expire tidily, go away quietly, primitive society, children of darkness, the law of the jungle, deserve to pull children from under the rubble. Every house is a tunnel where terrorists hide. Every child, every adult born as a crime, and so every death can be justified. And that's the language they use in all the headlines. 
a blast at the hospital. Palestinians died. Won't name who killed them, who fired the missile, and all done with weapons our taxes supplied. And that's why we say we won't call a ceasefire. Because we did the same thing to the colonize. In fact, they learned it from us in reserves we assigned and studied by South Africa to start apartheid. But the words that we use must be scrutinized. It's our language, they say, that is harmful and vile and the horrors and violence only told on one side. And so the oppressed must always qualify, can't speak their own lives, must condemn and apologize, held collectively guilty in the Western world's eyes, human animals, they said, and dehumanized. And it's not even hidden, it's all in plain sight. You can hear their own words on the news every night. And so children are rendered collateral damage while the world turns away and can't find the language a problem, they say, that is meant to be managed, to be wiped off the map, to be bombed and then vanquished, pushed out to the desert until they just vanish. We said nothing about checkpoints or open air prisons, nothing about administrative detention for children, cement in the wells when the settlers move in, no water, electricity, cut off provisions, maximum damage, don't worry about precision and no fighting back against the conditions. The story will only ever start with resistance. Why would they do this? They must all be villains. Why would they throw rocks? Must be their religion, inherently hateful. That's just their tradition. So we ship in more weapons for hundreds of billions, a cycle of violence consuming the innocents, and there's always a reason. They're all human shields, a depot for arms, every hospital conceals, every mosque filled with fiends, every bakery. So it's not a war crime to cut off the meals, to cut off the feeds, to bomb all the exits, say they cause their own deaths if anyone regrets it, a misfired rocket whenever the shells hit, blocked investigations and evidence selective, just muddy the waters. Western media accepts it, and all other stories not allowed to express it because they want Gaza defeated, erased and deleted, to take the seashore and inhabit the beaches, to mow down the olives and steal all the keys, to move in the houses as bold as they please, and they do it to you, and they did it to me. For generations, the wretched of the earth have been squeezed into ghettos and townships, reserves by decrees with the tanks and the courts and the bombs and police while the law chips away degree by degree and they'll say there's no option but to die on your knees while you ask nicely, please. Your existence is a blight to the powerful's ease and they'll never play nice, but they say they've the right. Still, they cannot suppress when oppressed people rise and chant out free Palestine, shaking the skies who cannot be cowed by the media's lies. And they'll say that this love is just hate in disguise. But there's so much solidarity that can't be denied, refusing the narrative of rule and divide to call for the value of each human life. So we chant and we sing and we march side by side and our voices cry out as our crowds grow in size. Long live Gaza. Long live Palestine. Thank you, everybody. Ooh. Thank you, powerful. Thank you, Elle. Um, that was simply beautiful. Free Palestine. We can't say it loud enough. Free Palestine. Um, that was a, a wonderful, fierce note to end the live portion of our rally. Um, please do stay tuned for more video messages from incredible speakers like Sarah Jama, Richard Falk, um, Penny Green, and many more. Um, so much has been said um, and shared. And I just wanna emphasize the importance of staying engaged, uh, staying informed, and most importantly, uh, continuing to take action. Um, I wanna quickly draw your attention to a letter writing campaign that CFPI and JPI are launching today to support Al Haq's legal case against arms transfers from Canada. If you're in Canada, please do take action. The link's in the chat. I also want to take a moment to, um, to express that, you know, there are, there are many things that we need to be calling for. Um, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute and Just Peace Advocates have put forward several demands um, in response to the ICJ ruling with the aim of ensuring that Ottawa respects its responsibilities under the Genocide Convention. Um, these include immediately suspending direct assistance to the Israeli military 
by ending permits for arms sales to Israel, by pausing bilateral military ties, revoking the charitable status of charities that are violating the Canada Revenue Agency rules by assisting the Israeli military, by announcing an investigation into Canadians uh, who are fighting in Gaza, in the, in the IOF, and by condemning Israel's genocide. So I want to thank uh, I want to thank you all so much for being here um, for the powerful, powerful, enormously powerful words of our speakers for the ability to be together in this way for the global solidarity. Um, please share this broadcast. Uh, we will be posting it. Help us get this out further. Um, I also just want to quickly thank the endorsing organizations that I haven't yet mentioned, the Good Shepherd Collective, Independent Jewish Voices Canada, the United, Na the United National Anti-War Coalition, Socialist Action, the Ontario Palestine Rights Association, uh, the Sabiel Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center, Samidun Political Prisoner Solidarity Network, Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network rather, the Ontario Palestinian Rights Association, the Canadian BDS Coalition, the International Action Center, Workers World Party, Hindus for Human Rights, and uh, and Mano Jogpath Shala Samiti in India. Um, and to all those behind the scenes that put together this global rally um, in just a few short days, um, in about 72 hours. And I'm going to hand it off now to one of those amazing people, um, Aziza Kanji. Thank you, Bianca. Thank you to everyone who made it possible for us to organize this massive event in such a short period of time. Dr. Mong Zarni, uh, Dr. David Palumbo Lu, who you both heard from, um, Enver Domingo, uh, Nason Lin, who has been holding it down with the tech, along with Karen Rudman from Just Peace Advocates uh, and Bianca, please. Um, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. I'm quite I'm quite exhausted right now. But thank you to everyone who organized. Thank you to all our speakers. And I think it's a testament to the power of what's been said in this room tonight that so many of our speakers, even those who had hard finishes, uh, stayed on for so long in the room and to continue to lend their love and support and their energy to the event today. Um, Thank you also to everyone who sent in their solidarity videos. We are so sorry we couldn't show them to you. They speak to the uh, profound connection that so uh, struggles for justice and decolonization and liberation across the world, the deep connection that all of these struggles feel to Palestine. And so we are going to show them all to you now that uh, we have the our technological capacity to do that has been restored. Uh, but first, before we show you those videos, uh, we are going to have the second poem by Lina, which we were not able to hear before, and then also a new music performance by Checkpoint uh, 303 called If I Must Die, which is a tribute to the poet Refat Alarir uh, Alayahama, who was a Palestinian poet, writer, and professor of English literature he uh, wrote the words of this poem, I Must Die, just a few weeks before he and his family were murdered um, by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza on December 6, 2023. And so we end also with this tribute to Rafat al and all of the Palestinian lives that have been taken in this collective execution of death penalty that Israel is continuing to engage in with impunity. Today I draw the tears that slide off of cheeks and drain into the sewers of our attention. You cannot see them because they speak a dialect of pain and suffering, foreign to our ears. Today I draw the screams as they echo soundlessly, endlessly, never finding a compassionate heart to reflect off. Today I draw a child whose smile is hollow from the friendship of war, war that sleeps underneath the skin, seeps into dreams and bloodstreams. They place the weight of peace on my shoulders, but I am not the dove of peace.
and I apologize, Palestine, for those who have forgotten your name and turned deaf to your calls, for the dusting picture frames and the pain that vibrates within your blessed walls, the foreign military boots in your mosques and the foreign hands caressing your lands, for peace treaties that come at too high a cost, for the political games that bring only loss. I apologize for the refugees, the widows, the detainees, the shriveled meadows, I apologize, and today, I find my voice to speak. Today, I draw the rocket's shadow, the men's bravery, the women's patience, the rows of cemeteries. For those waiting for help, those praying, 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 not to sleeping leaders, but to God. They pray as they fall, 100 dead, 500 dead, 1,000 dead, 2,000 dead, dead silence the world is silent and the resolutions are ashamed to speak they call on me to bring peace but peace cannot come without justice so beware of a dove that has witnessed too much too much too much beware of the child i raise with a rock in his hand and a dream they call on me to bring peace, but I am the dove of revolution. Today I draw the If I must die, you must live to tell my story, to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some string. Wide with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad who left in a place bid no one farewell not even to his flesh not even to himself sees the kite my kite you made Flying up above And things for a moment An angel is there
I must die, let it bring hope. If I must die, let it bring hope. Let it be a tale. Let it be a tale.